Hello. Hey, Marcus. Hey, can you, I can hear you well. Just start video, don't I? Mm -hmm. There we go. Hey, good to see uh, you, Phil. Uh, I'm going to put my headphones in. I can hear you on the speakers, aren't I? Yeah. That's not plugged in, that's why. I've got myself the podcast mic, mic here, look. <laughs> SM7, the famous podcast mic. Nice, yeah. I'm just using the mic in my uh, in my MacBook Pro because I, it turns out it sounds best with my voice and also in the setting because I have the like the fridge here and stuff. And when I use like a proper mic, it picks up everything in the room. <laughs> so yeah, that just sounds good. Yeah, voice sounds good. Sometimes there can be a disparity, can't there? If somebody's using a good mic, and so I did an in, uh, in, uh, interview recently and uh, we sort of podcasting and. And the sound on the the the, the guy that was talking to me was just like, ee, ee, and mine was kind of this posh sound, you know. So anyway, yeah, yeah you know, I have lots of um, trouble with you know because everything I do here is via the internet, and then the connections are sometimes really horrible. But I've sort of like made that part of the experience because like these conversations are meant to be totally real and just you know the way it is, yeah. and sort of like a reflection of this. Um, this period uh, we're in where like people are kind of like starting to um, work and communicate at a distance you know much more than just a year ago right and yeah. and so but the technology uh, hasn't really caught up and it's certainly not the uh, the internet connections like so when talking yeah. with people in parts of the world where there's still bad internet you know then it, it shows in these uh, conversations but uh, that's okay you know so yeah right. Yeah, strange time, isn't it? I mean, just just a lot of. I mean, I've seen so many. Uh, I, I actually started having conversations with drummers. I was just looking at one actually. I did a, a last summer. I did a peer, series of conversations with drum drummer friends of mine, and and I, I thought the problem was the audio was really bad. Actually, it wasn't that bad, you know. But I, I think the, the the weird thing is, I, you know, my friend one is a, like a weird angle. I think there probably should be audio podcast. But what I what I said to these guys was, I'd do it again. But actually, uh, the stuff they're talking about is really cool. So I'll, I'll, I'll make them audio podcasts. And, and I mean, they're actually really long. I mean, like, people like Jeremy Stacy, people like that, Steve White, you know, I mean, like ninety minute conversations. So I have to chop it up, I think, you know, for the podcast fine. But it's great. It's really nice to have these conversations. And like yourself, you know, being a musician, uh, being a drummer, uh, you know, I can maybe extract. You know things from drummers. You know, know you know, and, and knowing their history, I'd like. I'd like to talk. I mean, I'm talking to my friends at the moment. Like, I want to talk to people like Ash Sohn and Carl Brazil and these sort of guys. You know, but I'd also like to have conversations with uh, people like Dave Mattix and Bill Bruford and these these people that inspired me. Because it was interesting talking to Jeremy and Ash and Carl was they sort of came through level 42. You know, and I think it was kind of cool for them. In their teens, to, to the, that there was a British band that was kind of, kind of musical, doing some instrumentals and getting a deal and getting you know that kind of. Uh, and, but for me, I was inspired to play by people like Bill Bruford and and Dave Mattox and Billy Cobham and and all those guys. I, mean, I thought Billy Cobham. So it's interesting, you know what what you go through as a teen, you know, uh, to to sort of develop things. You know, when I, you know, this, yeah, this is, I mean, what's interesting about the world that we live in now, what the world I knew when I was a kid on the Isle of Wight was that I had access to very little stuff, you know, compared to what you have now. Of course, British television, bless it, only had the two shows, Top of the Pops. Well, I had three things, Top of the Pops with out and out pop music, which occasionally had a good thing, David Bowie or something, or the Old Grey Worcester Test, which is a rock show, and that had everything from hippie music to fusion. And then you have in concert, you know, maybe a 25 minute in concert thing on BBC Two. But that was it, no VCR, you didn't record it. You had to just watch it and remember it, you know. So I remember like the, when, I, when I first heard Thrust by Herbie Hancock, I think mm -hmm. the guy that played me that, uh, Bill, it was a wonderful guy that played, dropped loads of bombs on me, you know, this guy. But that he was the only one to have Thrust on the Isle of Wight, I'm sure of it, you know. So it was, it was kind of that rare, this stuff was, if somebody had a copy of Sweet Night at my weather report, it was really, it was like gold dust, you know, you, you know, so nobody would lend you their albums because you'd steal them, you know. 
you know, the, the first time that I was actually aware of um, an album or a record as a piece of art, I was already 10, 11 years old or something, which like nowadays, like my, my uh, 18 months old girl, she already understands uh, that somehow, at least it seems like it. And it's really, it's really interesting, like these, this generational um, uh, changes that happen as we, you know, sort of as we, uh, we ourselves kind of go through these phases in our life. And, yeah. Um, and yeah, like for me, I was born in 72. So it was still, it was still a little bit like you described, right? Like, you know, I, I didn't have much access to, to music other than um, mainstream radio. And like, interestingly enough, like in the 70s, mainstream radio in Germany was kind of, was kind of okay. You know, like you, you could hear good yeah. stuff. And, and, and in the 80s was, was the same. And uh, as you said, like uh, VCR in the, in the mid 80s, that's also, like, I guess, like when I first saw uh, Level 42 shows, which were maybe like Rock Palast, uh, oh, yeah. uh, you know, shows or something like that. Um, yeah, I know that's the, it's, it's really interesting because I wonder how the uh, available, availability of all this stuff sort of changes the, the development of passion in people. Right. And, and I do yeah. not know if it does or how it does. You know, I would I would hope it doesn't really um, kill potential passion in people. But I mean, what, what do you think? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I can see it both ways. It's great that people can go on YouTube or Spotify and, and access Billy Holiday, Frank Sinatra, Hendrix, you know, Return to Forever, whatever it is, you know. Mm -hmm. But I also quite like the world where you, you know a handful of things uh, because I'm self-taught, you know, I, I, had a, I had a teacher for the first three weeks of drumming and, uh, you know, he, he told me that, yeah, I think you should do that. But then he left, he left the Isle of Wight, he disappeared, you know, so I never had a teacher. So I was kind of figuring things out and I quite like the idea of, that I, I had a copy of uh, Gentle Giant in, in a glass house, or yes, you know, Fragile. And I was kind of trying, I was, I was trying to figure out how to do that my own way, not being mm -hmm. shown how to do it, not going on YouTube and saying, oh, that's how you do it. You know, I had to kind of figure it out. And I made, as a self-taught drummer, I made, you know, ridiculous technical, I made it very hard for myself the way I played, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, but that, cause it just seemed to be, that's how, you know, it's the grip it sticks in a very kind of tight way. It wasn't until years later when I saw Omar Hakim um, play with Weather Report in 83 that mm -hmm. I, I could see that you could hold the sticks in another way. And we didn't, you know, there weren't, there weren't gigs in the 70s. All the gigs stopped in the 60s, you know. So, like, it was, uh, the other one was a kind of weird place, but in a good way, because, like, I was very lucky because um, although my mum didn't have much money, when we moved back to the other one when I was a, a baby or a kid, two-year-old, I think, um, my father was a, a journalist working in the Far East. He did have money at that point. So we bought a big house. The thing was, within a year or two, his career had collapsed. He never came back to the UK. So we, we were raised in a single, single parent family. So my mum was always out working and we didn't have, we probably, we lived on a council estate around the back of our house. We probably had less money than those guys. But the thing was, we had this big house. So when my mum was out working and my brother and I got into playing music, we made this god awful racket and we could get away with it because we had a bit of a garden, you know, and mm -hmm, we were away mm -hmm. from the other houses. So we were really lucky like that. So we filled that space with music and we figured it out, both my brother and I self-taught, we figured, figured it out, you know, of course he had made loads of mistakes, but it became quite interesting um, that we, I'm, I'm quite glad that I didn't have access to I mean, I had two uh, two drum books that I worked out of, the Buddy Rich book of snare drum rudiments and the Wilcox and Solos, 126. And that was it. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't do any independence. I didn't do anything else. And when I started studying classical, um, uh, you know, for classical percussion, I had the Morris Goldenberg books. I went to the academy. So I had to learn tune percussion. But I never did it jazz independence. I never did uh, kit playing. I mean, I could sometimes, I, I would sometimes read these these books and it'd be somebody teaching you to play the paradiddle between the kick and snare. And I go, well, that's bloody obvious. You know, I, I, I figured that out ages ago. Mm -hmm. And like, I think I did a thing when I was 16. And you're just talking about 1973 or you're a year old. And I did this thing because I was hearing people like Ian Pace, drummers like Ian Pace and Bonham doing that. You know that thing with the toms and the kick, mm -hmm. you know. But I was doing it good, 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 like I had never heard of Alvin Jones. I never, I never heard him. Well, I, I later heard John Coltrane, so I did hear it. But 
that thing when you do the Tom thing, and I was doing that at 16, and now you hear all these gospel guys doing it, and I'm going, I think I invented that myself. I didn't. I, nobody showed me how to do that gospel thing or the mm -hmm. Alvin Jones thing. I figured that out. Also, the paradiddle diddle, you know, when you do right, left, right, right, left, left. Mm -hmm. I actually, before I got the Buddy Rich book, I, 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 somebody told me how to do a paradiddle. What do I do a paradiddle? That, 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 that. So I invented the paradiddle diddle. You know, and I, quite, <laughs> you know, I could. I did actually read it, but actually, when I read it in Buddy Rich book, I went, hang on, that's mine. Um, but I, I, I quite like that idea that um, that there's all this, you know, there's a kind of ethos. Uh, it's something in the ether about what you do with all this stuff. And you can actually find your own way there rather than just being given to you. You know, there's something and cool about that. I think that that all the um, the stuff that we work on as innocent people, right? Like where we haven't heard these things, we kind of like contribute to... Um, what's the word here like a collective unconscious thing where yeah, yeah. you know suddenly suddenly these these things that you know they become available to uh, to everybody somehow because like one person has worked on a specific exercise let's say and then and, and i mean it's 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 pretty much the same with especially with popular music because so many people hear it and then you can hear like when when for example in the late 80s early early 90s you had like the drum and bass stuff that started Right. And yeah. 10 years, 10 years later, people could play that way. Right. Yeah. So it's, you know, and um, yeah, you, you see, yeah. Um, you know, speaking of like uh, drumming, drumming styles, like what you just described um, in the 70s, uh, I, I still kind of like really love that that uh, decade for the because the drummers play the drum kit like like one instrument, if that yeah. makes any sense. You know, it just just felt like it was is one thing. Like you hit one drum, but everything else resonates, right? And like nowadays, like things have developed in such a way that there are some drummers who play more like each instrument is an individual track in a DAW, yeah. right? And um, and I, I'm not so keen on that, <laughs> to be quite honest, even though uh, I, I do belong to a younger generation. You know? I think it's interesting that I had a short conversation with... Um, this guy called Robert Scott, the first session I ever did when I was for proper, you know, proper session was at Mountain Studios in Montreux. And it was like for pop, there was this uh, guy called Robert Scott. He had a massive hit all around the world that year with pop music, this, this mm -hmm. sort of early, early electronic pop track, you know. But what Robin wanted to do when I got to the studio was to, I, I, you know, I had my sticks in my hand, I came ready to play, you know. He said, he wants like 10 minutes of kick and snare. You know, I want you to come up with a, pattern and what 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 the hell is this to click i didn't even know that existed and you know until i arrived in montreal i was just come off the other way a year before playing holiday camp to it so i was horrified you know and then, then robin said well this is you know, he kind of been inspired by Giorgio moroda and he wasn't robin wasn't doing it necessarily to uh, other than for the separation you know he wanted to hear a kick without the spill, like you were just talking about, he wanted to hear it yeah. completely free. So that was coming in at the end of the, so as you got to the, into the middle part of the seventies and towards the very end, it got very dead and dry, you know? And it wasn't until like, you know, 1980 with Steve Lily White and then Prince and all these things that drum sounds began to really open up again because in rock and pop music terms, everything get really dead, you know? But it was kind of that idea that you would put, you know, a kick pattern, on the floor or a pattern then you do the hi-hat and then you do the toms you know and it was all to click so it's kind of wild i went from being this sort of um purist drummer type person mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. going well I mean, the, the option i can spend the summer six weeks in montreux doing this with this guy or i can go back to my flat and clap them and and you know and see if i can get a gig you know so i decided to I, started, I decided to say in montreux so it was amazing i mean what was interesting was me and what i met wally Badder on that session and so I got a very strong connection with Wally. We got on really well. And then the following year, we did another M album, and I got Mark involved in that. So it was the three of us. So just before Level 42 happened, we did the second M album, the School for Official Secrets, and we were working to click. And then when we got into Level 42, the first four Level 42 albums weren't to click, except for two tracks, I think, Kuyete and uh, Charles Begun. Those, those were the click. So the first four albums weren't to click, but we had that mentality. So if you listen to the first record, our timing was a little bit 
more advanced than some of our, our peers in England at that time or Britain, you know, because of that experience, because we were, we had the discipline of actually on the second ML, we did play rhythm tracks to click. And that was mm-hmm. quite rare. It's about 1980. That, mm-hmm. that was quite rare at the time. I, I don't, uh, I don't know when clicks became standard fare for recording artists. And it wasn't until the fifth level we to our world machine that we, we recorded that most, you know, except for one track to click. But it's kind of weird spending six weeks on a project where it's all really metronomic. And um, I was studying classical, I was at the Royal Academy of Music at the time. So I was, I was studying classical music. And of course that elastic kind of time with classical music where you have to follow the conductor, it's very hard for me to get my head around. And then Robin wanted me to do the polar opposite where I had to really look at my hand on the snare to make sure that the stick, as I was recording kick and snare patterns, the stick was coming up to the same place. So I was really analyzing the time and motion. So it was a real interesting thing. And that's why I think level 42 in the early phase were really tight because mm-hmm. we had a slightly different mentality. I think if we'd have gone to our first album without those experiences of playing to click, I don't think we would have been as tight, you know, in our thinking, you know. Yeah, and I think that, you know, playing uh, tight and and playing, uh, you know, uh, to a click is not the same thing, right? You can still have an organic way of the yeah. tempo change and still be tied as a band, right? And I, exactly. I oh yeah, and you know, and, and that's very much kind of like like what I experienced when I heard those uh, Rock Palast gigs that I, I mentioned. You know, that's in, insane energy, really. Those those shows, like I, I really, it, it was it was really really. I have to say, it was a big influence in me as well. Just that oh, cool. energy, yeah. Yeah, yeah we, did, we, did, I said this, we did two Rock Palace shows. One was an in-concert in a theatre, which was really cool. That was 83. And then we did the big one in 84. I think it was Olympia Hall in Munich or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, not, not, whatever that was. No, not the Olympia Hall, but the, the big space in Munich where they did the Rock Palace. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was about 10,000, really huge crowd. And then I think John Cale and then Huey Lewis and the News. Mm-hmm. And, and, and we did it. But you know what? I think what happened was, I think, the, the, the engineer had set it up for Huey Lewis that he had a Lindrum triggered off the snare oh. and, a ki- a, and a Lindrum kick triggered off the kick for Huey Lewis because it was the um, <clears throat> power of, um, you know. But of course, with me, like the, if you listen to, I've got the DVD somewhere or the recording. If you listen to me, I, I do a press roll at the start of the first track we come yeah, on. And, it, and you come and, and it's going. Yeah, it sounds It's like, what? And we went back to the hotel and heard it a few hours later because it was kind of broadcast that night. And I was going, oh, my God, all these young German uh, drummers and musicians are going to think I'm this idiot going, you know. I want to find that engineer, man. If you know who he is, he, he put me in touch with him. He completely screwed up. And, like, so it was wild because the first track, and there's a track called Almost There, you know, quite a hardcore up-tempo funk thing. Um, the, the snare was being triggered with the kick as well. So going, <laughs> so I yeah, like, I, I do. I do remember that. But you know, this is this is something I wanted to mention earlier already. Like for me as a musician, sound quality for some reason is really not that important. Like I could listen to like the worst bootleg recording of my favorite artists, right, and really enjoy it very much because I sort of hear through the somehow I I just listen yeah. to the music. Well, I guess you know what I mean, right? So and for me yeah. it was a, was a big learning curve to kind of like understand that there's more uh, to the recording of music than just capturing the uh, the spirit, right? Right? There's also yeah, yeah. there's also yeah. the sound, you know. Yeah, it's kind of well, it's, you know, because like as you as you know now, as, as you progressed in your charisma, it's, it's really hard to let go of the details. You you get you obsess over the details all the time, and and like I've got the new album that's coming out. I've I've got one vocal which I just wish I could do again. It's totally fine, but I know there's a couple of lines I could do. It's going to be like that forever. It's always like that. I, I go back to drum tracks I did in the past and go, oh god, I wish we could do that again. It's kind of never ending, and I think that's. Mm-hmm. What, where you have to be, like, you know, it's like when you're mixing, you're, uh, I, I was working with a, a fantastic engineer on my album, Julian Mendelssohn, who did some of the Level 42 stuff, and he's in Melbourne. So, yeah. like, I think he was either eight hours ahead or nine hours, whatever, whatever, ahead or behind. So I was staying up all night, and we were, you know, it's like 2 dB more of this, please, and 1 dB less of that. And you get so crazy with the, 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 the details. 
Mm-hmm. And then now you listen back to it, you can't remember that process, but you have to, you don't have to be like that. There's a lot of people like Ethan Jones, people that mix by balancing, they just balance it and get a nice overall thing. But I've, I've always been obsessed with the details. You know, I think you really have to, particularly with the, the layers that I have on, on the stuff that I'm doing. It's not mm-hmm. complex music, but there's complex in terms of the layers, sonics, sonics of it. And, uh, and you just want to make sure it's as good as it can be. And, and then, you have to be obsessive about these things. You have to kind yeah. of, it has sure. to upset, has to upset you if you can't, if you, if you get a drum. I mean, if I'm playing a groove, if I'm playing a track on stage and I, and I, I feel a snare beats ahead, it really does mess with my head. And I, I, I have to be in that place. You're only as good as your last bar, you know, <laughs> as, as a drummer, you know. Yeah. yeah, I think that's 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 sort of like the mind of a of a great musician, right? You're never satisfied, and you're so sort of, yeah, yeah. And it you know it shows in in you know not just in critiquing yourself or judging recordings, but also in practicing and and kind of like trying to understand and like something that um, you know I. I don't know when I started following your Instagram or whatever it was, and I saw you that you were actually playing the piano. You know that was that was very nice to see that. Uh, you know, like the funny thing is, like when I was thinking about our conversation, I was thinking, oh, maybe the first thing I'm going to ask you is uh, about chord progressions. You know, rather than drums, <laughs> because yeah. I can, because I can I can I can tell and I can see that you're kind of obsessed um, with that that with that. Um, level of music as well right so it's not just as, as you say it's not just the one thing it's not just the drums it's not just the sound it's it's uh, uh it's all the details and and i guess this obsessing about things is also the fun fun of doing it yeah like, right yeah. i'm not i'm not one of the i'm not one of those people that will come off stage and if they get a compliment they're gonna go oh i was really bad and the sound was terrible you know or, mm. or like when i i I used to be one of those people when you would play a track to somebody, so all the, the second verse isn't quite right. And, you know, you know, musicians, they always get these preemptive strikes. And I'm not like that anymore. I, I'm very gracious if people like something. Uh, I believe them, you know, but I, I also, um, uh, but I, cause it's not actually a, a, an unpleasant place to be when you're really kind of trying to do it, do it right. You know, get it like, you know, like maybe John McEnroe would scream, you know, we got the ball, you know, missed the shot. You know, it's a bit like that, but there is joy in it. You know, if you, if you, if you uh, get a fill wrong, you go, oh God, I've got to do that again. That's, that's, why did I do that? What an idiot. I should have not have done that. Maybe I'll figure that out and I'll do it again. And if you get it right, it's great. I mean, that's the, it's a constant conversation you have with yourself. I think in mm-hmm. any kind of performance mm-hmm. where you have to critique yourself at a certain level. And I think, I remember, I remember, uh, what's that comedian, uh, jo- Joan Rivers, said a really interesting thing about comics that she'd met or known that like that they would fight and scratch and agonize over every line on their way up through clubs and finally get on the Johnny Carson show or something or get on a, a really big comic and they would get a really be a really big success. And uh, then they would go, right, I'm funny. Oh, I'm funny. I'm great. I'm great. And they would stop the process that got them there and they go right back down again. Because you've got to keep that pro- whatever the process is, you've got to, uh, unless it involves <laughs> copious amounts of drugs or something, you don't want to do things that are unhealthy. But you know you, the process, the, the agonising over that lyric, that that groove, the sound, you know, it's it's fun. I mean, I actually enjoy it. I I love the idea of analysing it and trying to figure that out. And the conversations I have with musicians in the room or with technicians, you know, to sort of no, that's not quite right. That, that we can do better, you know, um, and we find something that's really cool. I, I love all that stuff. It's funny, I mean, the harmony thing, I've got this, um, I'm, not, I'm not distorting on this mic, but I've got this thing here. This is my very first copy of, um, this is these songs of praise. Mm-hmm. It's like the Oxford Dictionary of all the hymns and chorales. <laughs> and this is, when I, when I was doing A-level music, I, I started playing the piano when I was 19, mm-hmm. and, I, and I, I was... I had an incredible guy I was in a band with, a wonderful musician. He basically like sat me down and you're gonna be a, you're gonna be a proper musician. And within two years I was at the Royal Academy, you know. He kicked my ass, you know. But he but the A-level music teacher gave me this book. He said, All the harmony you'll ever need is in this book. So look, most of my harmony that I use comes from hymns and chorales. So with level 42, when I was at the keyboard writing with Mark, that's why you hear triads. With, with our writing. With Mike, it's more, you know, ninths and extended chords and stuff like that. With me and Mark, it was 
an E minor, A, B, or mm -hmm. A first inversion. It's mm -hmm. all it's all first inversion triads, you know. Like mm -hmm. Mark would always write like um, you know, like McLaughlin, you know, you know, dun, 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 dun. you know that kind of split thing where you do the the root, the fifth, and the third above in that mm -hmm. kind of McLaughlin way on the guitar. Yeah. So uh, as part of the riff, Mark would write like that a lot, like June tune or uh, melodies that he would write uh, the bass bass part. On our, on our, and I would write these first inversions, try second inversions, and it worked really well. And I remember like we got, we got, a, I was maybe rabbiting on, but we got, I remember we got a review when we had that first success in Holland in 81. And the review, the headline said, the Beatles van den Funk, the Beatles <laughs> of Funk. And I'm like, yeah, this is amazing. Not that I ever can, I'm not comparing us, us to the Beatles or anything like that, but mm. it's the idea that what we were doing had a musical clarity because we weren't doing, you know, coming out of the 70s, a lot of funk things were, you know, the Philly sound, a lot of extended chords, a lot of guitarists doing ninths and, you know, elevenths and all these sort of big dense chords. We weren't doing that. We were doing basic pop hymn chords. Like, if you, you know, as you well know, that if you listen to Paul Simon, you're listening to, you're listening to church music. You're listening to those, that, that harmony, you know, the, the, the gospel harmony based on hymn chords, you know. So level 42 were a little bit like that, you know, very, very kind of simple structures, but with some, uh, beautiful movements in it, which gave it some flavor. And and then you have Wally and Mike coming at it from a different angle. And Mike particularly, like you listen to a song like Two Solitudes, where he has all these clusters, you know, and you can see this, he's got, uh, he starts at A minor and there's like, there's, there's about six notes all together. <laughs> and it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of just moving the odd note in the chord and getting those incredible sort of shifts that, that great musician can with just moving a note here and there, you know. Uh, with me though, I'd be like it would be it would still be D minor, or you know a, a D minor over C or something. I'd be very simple, but mm -hmm. it's inter interesting. I still I still come from that place. So the weird thing about being you know playing piano and stuff that I don't write funky. You know I play the drums. If I was to play drums in a group and other people were writing, I would still play drums like that because I I like playing you know funk drumming. But I don't write like that. I, I don't write funky you know it's very mm -hmm. pastoral it's very kind of um very like hymns you know yes yeah so yeah it's interesting and you Some know i think some funk. i i really i really think that it was it was uh like one of the strengths of level 42 was the combination of the funk and those uh more pastoral chord sequences and you know those yeah. spoke, those spoke to me a lot and like over the years, like from the first album to like the fourth, fifth album, like there was a, there was more and more of that uh, interesting harmonic stuff happening. And I, you know, like, I, I don't know why, but you know, whenever I, back then I didn't even know what it was called, but when I heard like some sort of modulation or is going to some other key or even just for one chord, right. It, it always, you know, yeah. that, that was kind of what I was, was after. And then in, in combination with the, with the groove based and like actually part parts focused composition. Um, I, I thought that was, that was just fantastic. And, you know, like, like, as you say, the level, the level of detail that you guys put into, into the records somehow, like when I listened to like uh, level 42, the first album, right. And like all those details and all, all these arrangement uh, things that you did and like, it's, um, Nowadays, you know, I can't really. Um, I, I mean, obviously, you guys did it back then, right? So the, the the amount of work that was was involved back then, I can't imagine how that must have been. You know, recording on tape and doing the the um, all the keyboard parts, and then there's the the glockenspiel, right, on uh, oh, yeah. Star Child and you know stuff oh, like yeah. that. I, I you good. know, it's I think it's it's totally awesome and just uh, totally to me it really sounds like an absolute labor of love rather than uh, a band trying to make music that other people might like right it's yeah I mean, we had no we had no idea how we were going to connect with people we were just doing what we could you know and we, we just found us we were an accidental band we found ourselves with a record deal uh, mark wasn't ever intended to be a singing bass player when he left the island he's going to be a drummer and like we were just jamming together and he was playing bass all the time. It was funny because we went to London, we got to London uh, and that I was at the Royal Academy and that was just up the road from, he was working in this place called Macari's in Shaftesbury Avenue in London, which was that at that time, that 
Shaftesbury Avenue and Charing Cross Road was just full of music shops, you know. So mm-hmm. all the musicians were going, Drum City, Rose Morris, all these amazing things. But I go down and see him and he's playing bass. And and, and what was weird about our mentality, coming off the Isle of Wight, we, we thought that every black musician we would meet in London was going to be like Stanley Clark, you know. <laughs> and so we, we thought we were going to be so inferior. In fact, all our friends were saying on the island, you'll be back in six months. They're too switched on up there for you. And uh, well, not all our friends, but some negative people. But I'd be saying that, you know, when, when say, uh, it might sound a bit weird, but I don't think it have, it have, doesn't need racist overtones, but, but what, so we, a black musician would come in and pick a bass off the, the wall and, and try to stop. And now and Mark and I were looking at each other, right now we're going to hear the shit because, you know, we're just these silly little white kids from the other white. And then I'd, I'd be looking at Mark going, you know, you sound better than this guy, you know, actually. <laughs> it took us a whole winter to kind of figure out that we, we mm-hmm. might actually be able to sort of hold our own in London. And mm-hmm. uh, Mark was extraordinary. So what was what was cool about the, the that band was figuring out that, oh, okay, we've got something to say. Okay, people like this. You've got to be kidding me. We've got a record deal. Oh, my God. But then the thing is, what are we going to do? Because none of us, we hadn't written, I, had, I hadn't written many. I've written some songs with my brother, but I hadn't written many lyrics. Mm-hmm. But also what was cool about it was in order to find a way to uh, bring things together, we were a band of where each people would bring bits, like the Star Child riff dun, 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 is Wally Badaroo. Mm-hmm. All that stuff. Dun, 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 dun. It was all Wally there. So, mm-hmm. But then the second section, da, 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 that's, all, that's a Mark King progression, mm-hmm. I believe. And, and, then, um, and then the... The solo section with the glockenspiel piano solo, those chords are mine. Bum, 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 you know, bum, mm-hmm. bum, bum. And so, like, that's that's my bit, and there's Wally's bit, and there's Mark's bit. And then me and Mike sat down to work on the solo. And so, I, you know, okay, well, well, we did it together. Right, you play the piano, I'll put the glock on it. Then we'll very speed the track down. I'll, so I have a bell, I'll do the glock again. So we have mm-hmm. that sort of bell like sound. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. So it was a lot of this. And we were just doing it. We had no idea that anybody was going to like this stuff. You know, mm-hmm. it just so happened that I think we all naturally had a gift for melody or or for things that were were kind of accessible. We weren't we weren't kind of going into a dark area. It was very shiny. It was very easy on the on the ear because we were quite we were quite simplistic musically. You know, I mean, Mark had an amazing ear for melody. He could do. He could just sit there and go into the corner and think of these. You know, and he would just kind of hear it and figure it out, you know? And then Wally would come along with these incredible sonic landscapes. And uh, we were so blessed to have him in our corner because as you know, he at that time he was doing Grace Jones, Foreigner, Talking Head, Talking Heads, you know, he was his later bit Robert Palmer. He was an in-demand guy and particularly the Grace Jones stuff, which was, uh, you know, the early eighties, which was very, very influential records. Hey, so, um, so how much older is Wally? Then two you... years older than me. He's not, you know, you know, I was oh. I met Wally when I was 22 with on the MT, he was 24. Mm-hmm. So he okay. was kind of like our, our our age and uh same age as my brother, you know. So I think mm-hmm. Mark's a year younger than me, what Mike's 18 months, you know, so we're all kind of little cluster of years. Mm-hmm. But what Wally was great because he was uh, a very incredibly intelligent, um very calm kind of influence on these crazy guys. Because me and you know, we were quite animated me and mark particularly you know we could get, get get a bit excitable you know but wally was this incredibly calming influence and i used to the i mean there's so many great things about being as you know being a professional musician figuring out that you have something to say you're you're worthy of being on that stage all these things but the the, the, the favorite memory i have of those times was, was being in the studio with wally and wally would wally spoke to pipe initially you know you know and he said i have an id i have an id and he put his pipe down and he start fiddling around with, you know, he had a Korg Polyphonic a Thousand Ensemble, he had a Mini Moog and he had a Prophet 5 and we had, you know, Fender Rhodes and piano, you know, and that was it, you know. Mm-hmm. And he would do these incredible landscapes on these instruments and um, and I was just sitting, in the, I was sitting in the control room and just watching do this stuff. He would do one sound and then he'd bring in a Prophet thing behind that and then he would kind of detune another synth so it's like they had a tune behind that first sound. Oh, it's just absolutely amazing to watch and uh yeah it was really cool and and he i think he was the reason why we were internationally successful wally because we could have done one in london i think we we're part of that brit funk scene at the time but wally was the key to the the sound that we had that was able to translate beyond that you know mm-hmm. very important to us 
So before the, the, the first official album, there were a couple of singles already, right? Or what was yeah. that? Like, um, because there's one track that I remember of this early tapes record called Love Meeting Love. Yeah. You remember that one? And, and particularly on that one, like the, the chord sequence again, like was uh, totally astounding to me. Um, and for something like that to be like the first Oh, one of the first things that a band recorded. I, I really, uh, you know, like you really set the course at the very beginning there, I think. And was, was Wally uh, involved in, in those early recordings as well? Yeah, I mean, like it was all done in one, that track was done in one day. And I, I actually had to borrow the money to fly Wally over because I said Wally needs to be on this, you know, because I was working, me and Mark had a good relationship with Wally having done the second M album. And I knew Wally could contribute to it. And all Wally, Wally, Wally came over with his Korg polyphonic, you know, on the train or plane. He came on a plane. And uh, we had one day to do this thing. So we recorded the track and we could also record the B-side, which is kind of live, you know, which is the live B-side. And, and it just worked. And, and all of a sudden we released that track. I think it was, we put out 3,012 inches on the small independent label. And the next thing, it, it's licensed to Polydor, sells 80,000 copies in the London area. And, all, and, they, and they gave us a five album deal, you know. So, okay. And I, had, I remember having to sit Mark down at the pub in Wimbledon going, he didn't want to do it. He was like, I want to be a drummer, you know. <laughs> I don't want to be a singing bass player. So we just, I said, you, you could do this, you're really great. And, and basically it was an opportunity and we went, all right, let's just sort of see what happens, you know. Mm -hmm. And, um, but Wally, I, I, I do take credit for forcing Wally into that situation because I knew Wally had this, I'd watched, I'd worked on two albums with him. I knew what he was capable of. And I didn't know myself fully then the potential that was going to come from Wally Badaroo in that moment. Because if you listen to um, the Grace Jones album, Warm Leatherette and then Night Clubbing, oh my God. If you listen to the, you listen to the keyboards on, say a track like Walking in the Rain, mm -hmm. the, key, the, the, what, the synthesizer work on, that's a great track because it's Sly and Robbie and it's a brilliant Alex Sackin production. Alex Sackin's an incredible engineer. But Wally's set, Sonic's on that. So that was a year or so later, you know. At that time, we didn't know Wally was going to become that, you know. So it was used to just playing a Korg polyphonic and when he playing a Prophet Five when he could, when he get hold of one. And I just knew he had something, you know. So I feel feel quite proud that I could, I saw it. Uh, I saw it before any uh, before other people did, you know. Like, oh, that guy has got something. So uh, he came over and did this track, and then all of a sudden, yeah, it was a cycle of fifths, wasn't it, done? I think it might have been influenced by I thought it was you by Herbie Hancock. Mm -hmm. uh, how's that how's that tune go? Uh, you know, um, just the dance, da 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 You know, it's like a, yeah, a cycle yeah. of fists. Well, so it yeah. may have been in Mark's head that cycle of fists idea. But yeah, because when you listen to the other British bands on that scene that we didn't even know existed until that record came out. But they are doing the kind of linear funk thing or two chord thing, trying to emulate a lot of American, you know, funk. And we were just doing a weird little thing on our own. And I, I'm, I, I, when that came out, we, immediately we started doing these gigs uh, because it's a thousand, you know, 3000 people at the Amsterdam Ballet with all the other bands, you know, and we, all, we just had an audience there ready to go. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a straight, you know, right place, right time moment, you know. Um, and then I think another single, we did the album, uh, which became the early tapes. And then we put out another single called Wings of Love. Mm -hmm. And then that album got shelved because we got signed to Polydor and then we did Level 42. So the early tapes came out after the first Level 42 album mm -hmm. because uh, Polydor bought it off uh, Elite Records and said, no, we, we don't want you to put it out. We'll buy it and we'll put it out as the early tapes, you know. But yeah, so the first album we did came out after the the first Polydor album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's such a great period. I mean, Wally sent me a photograph because I was I was convinced that Wally had used a uh, Prophet Five on Turn It On, which is the first track on the uh, first official Polydor album. Mm -hmm. ba, 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 you know, I said that's a Prophet Five, Wally. He said, no, it's a Korg cool polyphonic. I said, you can't get a sound like that on a Korg cool polyphonic. And then he sent me a picture 
of the studio at Chippy Norton with the Korg Polyphonic in the corner. And you actually look at the studio at Chippy Norton, the drums are in the corner behind a couple of those screens, you know, and there's the keyboard over there and Mark's in the corner with, with the bass out. There's no very little separation in that mm -hmm. tiny little studio in Chippy Norton, but that sound came out of that desk, the Trident Series B desk. And, mm -hmm. and the room, and of course, it was late 70s. Well, it was, this was 81 when we did that, but you're coming through the 70s with trying desks and things like that. And it's all in, it's all in the desks and all, all in the, uh, 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 and the and the outboard, you know, the fair charts, whatever they were using, you know. Yeah. It's quite some, I'm sure if you heard the drums in that room, you go, bloody hell, they sound dead as hell, you know. But yeah, it was, and we were, so I think when we, when we tracked it, say, Turn It On was tracked with me, Mike, Mark, and Wally. Um, and my brother did the guitar afterwards, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's kind of, it was wild to actually work. It was a tiny room we did it. It's amazing, you know. So did Wally ever play live with you guys? No, it's a source of much regret. I mean, I, I, we should have done some kind of special gigs with him. Mm -hmm. But he, he was a, a session guy. He was writing and composing music. He wasn't into the live thing. You know, he was, he got, he you know, he loved making contributions to recordings. That's where he lived, in the mm -hmm. studio. Mm -hmm. He wasn't going to be, he, he wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been good for him to be on the road. It was, the repetition of touring was not, not his mind set, you know. Mm -hmm. So he sent us out to do the, all the legwork while he just, you know, <laughs> wrote, he wrote some tunes and took the royalties and went off to do Grace Change, you know. No, it's great. It, it was, it was actually a lovely thing, you know, and I, I, I think when we did the, later on, when we did these big gigs like Wembley Arena and places like the Olympia Halle, uh, the Olympia in Paris and, Mm -hmm. I would have, I would have loved it if we could have done some special moments with him because, uh, you know, he, he, yeah, it would have been great. He would have, he would have loved it too, I think. But yeah, we, we just, it didn't come into our minds really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. So in the first few years, you were just a quartet, right? And then later on, you had more musicians on stage. Yeah, we had a percussionist for the first period of time, for the first three years, I think. Oh, okay. Uh, Oh, the first year, not the second year. But I wish we'd had a Leroy, a great guy, a great percussionist, great conga player, man, bloody hell. Mm -hmm. I wish we could have kept him, actually, because I, I do like percussion, mm -hmm. you know. But with, later on, we had a sax player and we had a, a lovely backing singer to augment the vocals with, with us, Annie, Annie. So we, we, we became a six-piece, you know. Mm -hmm. And also we started using sequences later, which kind of did my head into it to some extent. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm, quite, I'm quite into technology, but not the way we were using it. It was very basic. Talking about 1987, it's very basic technology, no no feel to it. You know, it's kind of really quite brutal. Click, 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 gang, 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 gang. It's kind of like, oh my god, it really felt like a like kind of you you're, you don't have a, you don't have any controller or a say anymore. You know, but I mean nowadays technology is much more organic. Did did you also have to run the uh, the click track? Were you the guy to start it and stuff? Or I used to know Mike did. Yeah, Mike Thank had the sequences, and uh, I, 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 we did. I used a Lindrum on one track, a World Machine, mm -hmm. uh, a Lindrum part, which is on the record actually, which Wally is Wally's part. But I, I would have to start that with my foot. And it's incredible when you think of how how temperamental those things were. You know those, you, you know buttons. Were, but it never, it, it never, it never went wrong. You know, but but you know, <laughs> and Mike, Mike, Mike. Uh, a couple of tunes you might have. Um, a sequence for augmenting the bass, but when it got to the point of, of keyboard parts and sequences all flying around off a sequencer, and one of the best keyboard players in England just sort of clapping his hands, yeah. I thought there's something not right about this, you know. And that was yeah. kind of the end. That was the end for me. It was. It was uh, I have a theory about why why we went that way, but I I, I just feel like um, we didn't need to do it. And having some sequences is cool, but. We we could we could re we were really locked at that point. We didn't need it, you know. We didn't. It, we we may have needed an augmenting keyboard player, but we didn't need to have a sequencer doing that. But yeah. I mean, people use sequencers all the time now. It's not a problem. But at the time, it sort of freaked me out a bit. You know? I, I think in in hindsight, it's it's true what you say, but I also can kind of uh, uh, see why back then that that sound in the mid '80s, right? Like with uh, yeah, it's it sort of became something that people use as a reference, and then like like the idea to bring that onto the stage was I think is wrong. But back then maybe it was something that just was so attractive 
for whatever reason, um, and you know better than I, but you know, my, my friend, Pat Masolotto, he, he told me a lot of stories about, uh, cause he was also uh, a guy who very early on embraced electronic, um, gadgets yeah. let's say in the studio and then also brought that on stage and he said like it was an absolute nightmare with with mr mister he he was running all that stuff and as you say like the the lindrum um probably doesn't come in at the right time and then you know like all these these things that could go wrong back then but the cool thing is like playing with pat now so if, if you're interested in that like the setup that he has is amazing now because he has just like this SPD um, pad where he has the clicks for the tracks as we play yeah. and he, he can bring them in and out at any time. That's pretty amazing. Like, so he really acts as an, as an orchestrator, not just of the, the, the actual sounds that you hear, but also yeah. of, of the guides that he gives us sometimes, right? So if we kind of like speed up our elegy, he throws in the click for just one bar you know and stuff like that it's it's pretty amazing what can be done nowadays especially with the you know the personal the in-ear monitoring and like you have your own mixer in front of you and stuff like that it's it's pretty amazing i have to say i wonder what that would be like because obviously what we didn't have in ear monitoring so my ears obviously suffered greatly mm -hmm. because of the volume yeah. but the thing is i i something about in ears it feels a little bit like you're you're not in the room not in the space i i know why it's probably much better for your ears but also you get a much better overall control of the sound, but there's something about that. Well, it doesn't make yeah, sense. Yeah. I, I, I know, I know what you mean, but I have to say for me, it's, it's, uh, it's been an absolute relief to be able to do that. And like the, the in-ears that I have, like they are in, they are not really uh, super, how do you say dead, you know, like I can, yeah. I can still hear the room a little bit and, and playing with Pat was extremely loud. Right. So I still get the physical sensation. And somehow, like at the beginning, I, when I was when we were going to in-ears, I thought that maybe my instrument would kind of like suffer because there wouldn't be like enough feedback uh, from the monitor speakers to the guitar. So less sustain and, you know, a, a more a, a deader instrument. But that was actually not the case. Like the instrument really also picks up the, the sound from the room and the PA actually. And at least my instrument does. And uh, so I have to say it's it's been it's been great. And like I, I did a tour with um, uh, a guy called Devin Townsend um, a couple of years ago, and it was a 10 piece band and there were no click tracks, no no backing tracks involved at all. But we had like the, these amazing um, uh, monitor engineers for in ears and like it was one of the best bands ever uh, and well and, and tours. Like it was incredible. So I, I think like having the, the mindset of the, let's say of the 70s and 80, early 80s, um, playing without click tracks and having the fantastic sound in your ear, that's kind of like, um, I, I have to say, I really enjoyed it. You know, and I, I well, but, uh, yeah, <laughs> you, 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 would, you know, if we were touring now, we would, we would be doing that. I mean, I, I, I did actually, I did a, a thing at the National Theatre about four years ago, and that was all, you know, in-ear monitoring. You had to because of the, mm -hmm. the theatre is like that, isn't it? You had to, this, the, 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 the sound people, so there was a girl do the sound, it's absolute genius, you know, like punching in all the dialogue, you know. And uh, <laughs> of course, so that was interesting. It worked really well. But yeah, I quite like, I mean, my, my ears really suffered because of the volume and I have tinnitus now. But mm. uh, I I did quite like the rock and roll because Level Forty Two were were two bands really. They were a recording band and they were a live band. And live it was a completely different situation. I mean, with the with the sequences, it did sort of tame us a little bit. It calmed us, so we you know, our, our tempos were really solid. But with the live, our tempos would be quite a bit above the record sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not that I don't think we were, we were speeding up to it. We certainly weren't dragging, but we we may have sped up a little bit. But but it was kind of you know, it would be a lot faster because of the adrenaline. But with the sequences, that uh, that doesn't happen. But it was uh, it was kind of a very very energetic band, very powerful, and, and lots of blood on the skins and blisters, and it <laughs> felt great. But it was a very different experience in the studio. It was much more. Well, what are we doing? What are we? Doing? If you got a riff, let's try and write. You know, it was actually making music for the first time, and um, uh, a very little, a very different kind of energy. You know what is. Um interesting to me like when i um recall the level 42 albums um up until you left 
um, the pursuit of excellence is sort of like it has it was almost not part of the canon for me for a long time for some reason i don't know why that was probably because i i got to know it last or something i don't know um but do you feel that it's kind of like a, a special one in a way like in a good or in a bad way i think, I think there's some of our i think we did lose we had this, we had a problem a second album syndrome and i think yeah. i think there's a couple of tracks, like there's a track called uh, what's that? Uh, there's a couple of tracks that are very. There's a couple of really bad songs on the album. I mean, I think "Are You Hearing What I Hear" is is a track which was good live. We didn't record it well at all. It's really weak on the record. It's it's a really weak rhythm track compared to how tight we were at other times. It was a, it was very rushed, and you know there's what's the song on side two? Um, da 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 da. What's that? I don't know what that song is. Uh, that was just that was horrendous. You know, like mm-hmm. here's a riff, here's a thing, and there's another, there's a B section, here's a chorus. The chorus is mine. It's awful chords. Uh, yeah, so those that we we kind of we didn't do so well. There were I think there's two or three really cool tracks. There's a pursuit of accents. Here's from Middle's Great and um, Shapeshifter. One or two other things. There's some Eyes Water Falling. I love. Yeah. It was just kind of a wild, my brother doing a Susie and the Banshees guitar part, you know. <laughs> um, and then the Chinese Way, which is a terrible lyric, but it's a cool rhythm track. But that, yeah, we, 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 it was a bit of a hit and miss record, that one. And then we then we had the the experience with the third one, you know, where we were organised on the third album. The first album, we, we put everything we had into that record, so all these ideas came to bear. And most of those tracks stand up, I think. You know, I think the, the second album is a little bit problematic. You know, they, they call it the second album syndrome. And mm-hmm. I think we had that, you know, I think we had that a little bit, you know, to be honest. Mm-hmm. And then I think True Colors was was the album where the sound of the band sort of completely changed somehow, right? Yeah. And it was, was kind of like very, uh, even like still, I think, kind of futuristic sounding for some way or another. And I wouldn't even know why. You know, there is there was something very uh, strange about it, but I still love it. You know, but yeah, it got to a, a little. I mean, the band were having a little bit of a problem at the time, uh, and we worked with Ken Scott. It was my idea actually to work with Ken, but it, Ken took the sound from the shininess of the Earth Wind and Fire guys, Larry and Verdine, to mm-hmm. the Ken sound, which is a little bit darker, Fairchild compressors, and you know, kind of very earthy. Which is great, and, and perhaps I mean I don't know about Hot Water as a song, you know, maybe the lyrics or whatever, but as a track, it's probably the closest we've, we've ever come on record. To, you know, the, I'm talking about the remix to capturing what we were like live. You know, it's like really powerful. You know, but uh, I love that album. You know, I mean, I kind of got a bit of stick from the label because of the lyrics on the album because let's talk about the Bauhaus and and, all the, and, and sort of like reading really Arthur Kessler and. Tom Wolfe and you know Carl Jung and, and I was getting a little bit ahead of myself I think and the band you know I think the label wanted like Earth Wind and Fire Let's Groove Tonight you know like they got yeah. kind of got that with some of the tunes on Sounding the Light you know obviously the sun goes down mm-hmm. uh, I, but the thing was a lot of that music you hear like a song like True Believers that's not my music that's Mark's that's all Mark you know mm-hmm. so I can't be like you can't lay the blame at my door for that not being a commercial track because it was it's just it's just what we were doing at the time. There's some really beautiful things on it. There's a track called Hours by the Window, which yeah, I think yeah. is one of, one of the best. I love that track. Um, and wonderful. there were there were one or two there were one or two instances where I wasn't involved in the music and I just wrote the lyrics, and that's one of them. I mean, I remember that the other one was a physical presence on World Machine, where I just gave Mark a set of lyrics and he put it to music, which I think is, is a great track. But uh, I remember Mark coming into rehearsals one day and he had that melody. And, and he may have made it up on the spot, you know. I have a feeling he might just improvise the damn thing. But it sounded so beautiful. And I was reading Dialogue with Death by Arthur Kessler. So I was going to go there with that song, you know. And that's just amazing. I wish so we'd who, have done it live. So who, who wrote a, a Floating Life? The lyrics. Actually, that, that melody, the verse and the, 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 the verse and chords are mine, actually. Da, 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 da. Yeah, and then I yeah I wrote, wrote the song. I remember I got like a... I was going through Covent Garden and I saw this book in a bookshop, a Chinese book, it's called A Floating Life. It's all about these China, Chinese proverbs, you know. Mm-hmm. And I thought, yeah, that's what I'm living. I'm living a floating life. But then I, but then I turned it into a, 
a, an idea of somebody who was kind of brought back down to earth by somebody else's corruption and, you know, about their being ruined, you know, by somebody else's um, devious and maniacal behaviour. So I turned it into a kind of like weird, devious song, but actually the, the idea came from some beautiful Chinese proverb, you know. But yeah, it was kind of like one of my bits and Mark came up with the chorus. So that was that was the nature of things at the time, uh, you know. I have to tell you, I really love that song and love the lyrics. And I, for me, it was always uh, about the life of a musician on the road. That's how I interpreted yeah. those lyrics and, and it was pretty powerful and sort of educational also, um, you know, as a young man uh, having to or wanting to uh, get into music. And uh, I don't know. I think, I mean, for me, like there was, I was probably 26 when we did that, I think. So like I, I, I was, I had a couple of situations where I'd felt, I'd, I felt taken in by people, you know, like either relationships, personal relationships or friendships, you know, and I felt betrayed a little bit. Right? And so they're kind of quite bitter in, in your hands as a photograph and she, she turns to laugh, you know, it's like kind of like a moment where you're, where you're, mm -hmm. Like maybe somebody's going to blackmail you in the press, you know, with the photograph or something. You know what I mean? Something. I don't know. There's something dark going on, and I felt a bit angry, you know. Mm. So I, because like I, I did like that, and I kind of like. I was trying to trying to explore how to write different kinds of songs, really, like a thinking in a cinematic way, like like you, you can imagine a scene, you know, between two mm. people. And mm. what I love about that is that you write that scene, but other people that hear it are gonna they're gonna picture another scene. Which is the great thing about this whole process. I think you, 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 you fill in your own room. You fill in your own beach. You fill in your own sky. You know when you listen to lyrics, don't you? I mean, I'm sure yeah, when yeah. when Peter Gabriel could have thought of Mercy Street and when he envisaged those lyrics based on that poetry, um, it, 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 like let's take the boat out. When he sings that, he sings that line. He's he he's probably imagining a stretch of water that he's familiar with. When I when I when I hear that line, I, I have my own boat in my own, my own sea, you know, yeah, and that's the yeah. great thing about this process, isn't it? You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, it's not just for it's not just for the lyrics; it's for the music itself as well. Like, and, yeah, yeah. you know, and and that's why I think you know, compromising with one's music is kind of like, or even thinking about what people will think about the music is absolutely pointless. And for yeah. me. Absolutely yeah, yeah. So you can have explanations and sometimes it is interesting to i mean i love all that stuff about uh, filmmakers talk discussing a scene and I, I love to hear musicians discuss their motivations mm -hmm. uh but they also come to come to a point where do you really want to know what brushes picasso used to paint that picture i mean i mean how how detailed do you want to get so it is interesting the motivation but i don't need to know all the technical uh and i certainly don't want to hear remixes of stuff i mean i, I really I'm a huge Beatles fan, but I don't really want to hear a remix of, you know, a 20, 21st century remix of that. I don't, I'm not interested, you know. So it's kind of, I, I, there's a point where I kind of go, I, I really want to have, hang on to what the artist at the time envisaged. Like, I don't want to hear a remaster of Hoagie Carmichael's Stardust. You know, I don't mm -hmm. want, I don't want to, I don't want to go back and hear Sgt. Pepper uh, yeah. remaster. You know what I mean? I, I, I love the fact that artwork has a time and a place and art, art has a time and a place and it captures that time and a place. I mean, in the terms of music, you're capturing with the 1940s recording, you're capturing the, the kind of where it was recorded, the wires, the valves, and, and that's the experience. And why do you want to change that with a digital interpretation? I just, I just think there's a cultural aspect to the whole thing. And uh, you're in a certain moment and even like a band, uh, uh, level forty two aren't one of the like, level forty two aren't the level of a Bowie or a, you know a, you know the, the you know these incredible like the Beatles or whatever, but it's still art. You know everything that you create when you're in that headspace, it, it is art. You know because we were we were operating artistically, and this is where we went had problems with the label because we were we were wanted to talk anti war songs like I Want Eyes or uh, Ours by the Window or maybe. Uh, anti-disinformation songs like Kansas City Milk were talking about the lies we're told by the media. You know, the label didn't want us to do that. They wanted to let's groove tonight, baby. Yeah, let's get down. Mm. They wanted us to be a British earth wind and fire. You know, mm. and so we were getting. I was, I was getting particularly a lot of stick from the label for doing that. But I didn't give a shit. You know, because I, I was. I was saying to them, look, you know, 
a song like Kansas, a riff like Kansas City Melbourne is not going to lend itself to you saying, let's get, out, let's get down tonight. It's not, it's darker than that, you know. And same with True Believers, it's darker than that. And obviously the chant has begun. I mean, that's not going to be like, come on, everybody, let's have a good time. It's a heavy track. It's like, you know, it's about something else. You know? And, I, and I, I think that was, you know, I think bands like should have a dark period. You know, they should have their, like, you know, Brit Springsteen, before he did like Dancing in the Dark, he went and did Nebraska. You know, he had this kind of, you know, on, recorded on the cassette and this very, you know, he was struggling at the end of his 20s. He was coming to terms with uh, all sorts of changes. And he went and had this, very kind of dark album, which I love, you know, but he, he went to this place and then he came back with a succession of very, very powerful, commercially successful albums, you know, but I think it's good for artists to have a curve, you know, it's why I love Radiohead so much. I mean, Radiohead are one of my favourite bands of all time because they do, uh, they go through the creep thing and they do Plastic Trees and they do all these very accessible songs, even though it's still really interesting. And then they do OK Computer, which has one of the greatest records of all time, I think. One of the mm -hmm. best recordings of all time, absolutely. Mm -hmm. but one of my favourite albums. And then they go and do Kid A for crying out loud, you know. Mm -hmm. they, just, they just rip up that blueprint and go off and do something else. I admire mm -hmm. that so much. Mm -hmm. I, 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 they have such bravery because, you know, when, when you have a, an album like OK Computer, you know that the label's going, can we have a few more of those guys? Can we have a few more? You've hit upon something here, like number one in America and number one in England. You know, we want we want another one of those, please. And they went just no, we're going to do this. So you listen to what's the first track on Kid A? What's that called? Uh, Christ. Yeah. Brains. It's but it's just that when the label heard that, I'm sure they freaked out. <laughs> but I, I love them so much. It's, an, it's such an amazing album, Kid A. Unbelievable. Oh, God. Yeah. 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 And yeah. Bowie did the same thing. Bowie would get to Ziggy Stardust and then he wrote, I'm quitting. And that's enough for Ziggy Stardust. And he goes and does, and then within two years, he's doing Station to Station, you know, Fame of Fame with John Lennon and going to Funk and, mm -hmm. and Blue Eyed Soul. And then he's doing Bowie, the trilogy, you know, Berlin mm -hmm. trilogy. What an artist that is. Because the label, all the time, the label are going, no, this is really good. Do more Ziggy, more Ziggy, you know. But no, I, I'm going to go. I'm going to go over here now. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're into something quite serious when you have somebody that has that kind of level of courage. You know. You know, it sounds to me like everybody in in your band back then really loved music, right? And just loved yeah. making music just for the sake of music, right? In initially, yeah. Or, yeah. Initially, yeah. Literally, yeah. yeah. And, and what what what, ha what happened then? Like, what what about like uh, running in the family, for example? I think the, the, the real step to that thing is World Machine because World Machine, I remember going around to everybody's house at, at the end of 84 and we got a bit of stick from the label because uh, although we we had a gold record on our third album, then we had a silver record on the fourth album. So obviously commercially we'd taken a step back in the label's eyes. Yeah. And so what was the last album of, of the deal? Let's go, Let's we need to be a bit more proactive. So why don't we produce ourselves with a great engineer and we can do it, Wally, the band, and uh, we found this in Julian Mendelssohn, this absolute genius engineer. But we then decided to write all the material before, because a lot of True Colors was written in the studio. You know, we, we did it uh, kind of bit, taking huge risks, you know. But we wrote all these songs over that winter, 84 into 85. And then we went to the studio. And so we, we, record, we, we were gonna do it in a different way, record to click. And, uh, but I think the writing was as organic as it ever was. Like something like Something About You, which became the breakthrough single, was written just like in a normal way. Me and Mike had an idea, and then Mark and Wally had a verse, and, my, and then my, Wally reharmonized the intro, and my brother finished the lyrics. And it was like, it was just, but it just so, so happened to be a kind of really accessible idea, but it was written in that normal, organic way. Mm -hmm. when we, you know. And that became a huge hit, so that all changed the whole landscape for us. But there were other tracks like World Machine or A Physical Presence or a track like Good, A Good Man in the Storm, which I really love. Me and Mark wrote that together, one of my favourite tracks, we, things we ever did. And it had a lot of soulfulness and, and uh, I think artistic integrity. But when it came, once, once Something About You became massive, then uh, the next thing was to do Lessons in Love. And that was kind of the formula, you know, with my brother's guitar, and it's kind of based along the lines of something about you. And then it became a little more clinical, a lot more, a lot more into the sequences and machines. 
Uh, not that we didn't use sequences on the recording, but we had to do use sequences to, to replicate it live, you know. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and it was that was the problem. Actually, actually, there was only major sequences on one track on that album, I believe, which is uh, "To Be with You Again." Uh, most of it was actually done, uh, like say the keyboards on "Children Say." That was all played. But mm -hmm. then, in order to do it live, you have to have extra keyboard parts. That's when we use sequences, you know. But then it became a bit more formulaic and. Uh, it, I think it was soulless. You know, mm -hmm. we I mm -hmm. put my heart and soul into it, but it was nothing like what had happened before. Because the the organic success of World Machine happened just because we were writing in a different way. We got we got better at writing songs, and we were more organised. And we all each as individual musicians, we all had our shit together. I really had my drum sound together. My brother had his guitar sound together. Everybody had their thing, and all of a sudden it just came together. You know, and it didn't require too much thought. But when we did, when we um, did Running the Family, we we wrote we wrote the track Running the Family as a single. We mm -hmm. wanted to, we want you know Lessons and I was written as a single. Could Children Say was written as a track and it became a single. And Children Children Say was the last time that me and Mark wrote together like mm -hmm. that. We you know the, those are my chords in the verse. That's his riff, and then his chords are the chorus. I think Mike wrote the top line for the chorus and I wrote the lyrics. You know? There was mm -hmm. now that kind of that that the two of us together. Uh, was for the last time, you know. Um, so running the family was a much more clinical affair. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. also the absurdity was like we'd written Lessons in Love early in the year. I think we wrote the backing track to Children Say in January of that year. And then we, we, we're touring all the way up to the summer. We did Glastonbury in June. And then we had one week to do the to finish the writing. And then mm -hmm. we went to the studio for six weeks and came out and were back on the road again. So we had the six, a week to record and, and, and six weeks to a week to write and there were six weeks to record the most important album in our career. And then we go back on the road with no chance to redo anything. And that, the management were off their heads and we were, we were taking enormous risks. I think if we'd have had a chance, we probably would have gone back and done more tracks. To, I, I didn't like to be with you again. I hated Fashion Fever. It was the worst, the worst thing. I, I mean, it's, hard, it's horrible to say that you know, it sounds really spoiled to be in your own band playing huge gigs and you're, you're moaning about having to do a track. But it was mm. a horror show for me every night to have mm. to start the set with that bloody track, you know, because it was all sequences. <laughs> and mm. uh, so, yeah, so it became a problem. And, and I knew my time was over then, you know, because mm. it, wasn't, it wasn't me. I, I really bridled at this kind of wall of sound, you know, hang on, I need some space. I mean, you know, you listen to a track like uh, uh, A Physical Presence of True Colors, there's loads of space in that track. It's just open and it's, you know, here's a keyboard part. It's like, a, it sounds like a band, doesn't it? Like, here's the bass part, here's my brother's beautiful guitar, here's the drums and here's the keyboard part and here's some vocals. And it sounds like a four piece band with Wally doing his thing. Whereas if you listen to uh, something like To Be With You Again, it sounds like a, there's a whole freaking, you know, electronic ensemble going on. It's nothing mm -hmm. to do with, nothing mm -hmm. to do with these guys anymore. And I think we lost, our way with that a little bit. So do, do you remember how that happened? Like like who who made those choices to make those arrangements in the studio with the sequences? Or did that just happen because the technology was there? Well, the technology, we, we started to use sequences on the road of, after World Machine. So mm -hmm. we had like, uh, in order to do something about you live, you had like, there's a couple of keyboard parts uh, that Wally did. Um, that we had to have live as what Mike couldn't do. So that was running a click and that. And so because we started using sequence and they became available and then Mark. Oh, I see. Like I think I don't I can't remember all the tracks actually. I think again, a track like say the ballad it's over, which is a really beautiful melody of art. All those keyboards are Wally playing it, you know, but in order but then in order to do it live. I think the only track that was heavily sequenced in the studio was uh, to be with you again. I think maybe a track called Sleepwalkers had the sequence on it. Mm -hmm. But when but but it was like brutal, you know. Oh no, Fashion Fever had a sequence on it, you know. So brutal sequences. So Mark went off and wrote these things, and he was putting everything into it. And it was almost like pushing the other musicians out of the way, you know. It was like like I know what the shit is, and I know how to play that keyboard part. And, and I'm just going, well, hang on, why don't you let Mike come up with something, you know? But anyway, mm -hmm. it was it was fine. We, we were pushed for time, and I just knew I couldn't do that again, you know. I I, I 
I, I could see that was going to be more of that. We were, we were we, at that point, you know, at the end of that year of running, you know, when we were promoting winning the family, we'd been touring for three years nonstop with absolutely no break. And the band mm-hmm. was at, band was at the breaking point, literally. Mm-hmm. I, was, I ended up in hospital, actually. My brother ended up in hospital. We'd, we were exhausted. And, and then I could see another two or three years of this because certain people in the band wanted to have a million quid in the bank, you know. So it, was like, mm-hmm. it became very, very financially driven. And uh, I just, the soul left it for me. And that's fine. And I, 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 have, I have related this story recently because I've been thinking about it a lot. I remember talking to Ken Scott about this, like, because I was, I always thought there was more that we could have done or we hadn't lost our way like that. But he was saying, you know, he remember he had a conversation with Ken and Ken's worked with so many incredible people and so many musicians. And he said, listen, I've, I've worked with so many bands and artists that never even made the first album or maybe made one record and then mm-hmm. it imploded. And you guys did seven studio albums, a live album, and you, you know, you had this time and that was my entire 20s, level 42 was 22 to 30. And, you know, you did all right, you know, and I think that's the way to look at it. Like uh, we had a finite amount of time that we could be together and we did a certain amount in that period. And that's, and I think there's a, actually there's quite a bit of integrity in that, you know, and I think there's a lot of integrity in me and my brother going, no, that's, that's enough for us. We, we, we're not going to have, yeah. we, we could be, we could, we would have been millionaires if we stayed, but we said, uh, you know, I think we've done enough. And, uh, I think I think in, I, what I what I love about musicians is what we talked about your Radiohead. I love people that are honest and have integrity, and I think you need to live your life by that. And sometimes there are consequences because you might not make as much money, but the reality is, the, if you don't live your life in that kind of honest way, that it's just eats your soul, you know. And I think I think the moment that really really freaked me out with Low Forty Two. I don't want to go on about it, but there was a moment where we were about to go on the road. Uh, we we're about to do the promotion. Um, and we had to go to this studio. Um, what were we doing? And we had to we had to do a photo shoot for the album. And we're given all this Levi clothes to wear. I had mm-hmm. no idea this was going on. And mm-hmm. what, what's this? We're all wearing Levi's. And the next thing I know, and I I didn't know this was happening actually until it happened. On the album cover, you have like Level Forty Two and Levi's on our fucking album cover. You know, <laughs> that was the moment that was the big sellout for me. Um, there was absolutely no need to do it. We were already we were making loads of money. We were selling out venues like Wembley Arena. We'd done four nights. We were going to do eight nights, and like um, then we have to have a, a, a logo on our record. It's the yeah, it's ultimate horrible. sellout. Horrible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And horrible. It, that that's the moment where I I I knew that my time was done. It was like um, maybe it was more the management that we had, but it was still something we should never have allowed because what. You know, how, how dare we do that to our fans, get to a place where we work our asses off and then sell out like that. It's not acceptable, yeah. Mm. That's why I always love you too. I, I'm not a massive fan of Bono's opinions on things sometimes, but what I love about you too is they've always had that integrity. When they had that manager, Paul McGuinness, they never allowed any corporate black branding. I know they did that thing with Apple later, which was mm-hmm. a bit of a nightmare really, but they mm-hmm. never, they never like this tour by Coca-Cola or, or like with the Rolling Stones and they have Volkswagen, you know, I, mm-hmm. or, or Mike Jackson with Pepsi Cola or something. I think it's really important that um, musicians, if they get, they have success, if they remember what it was like to be 16, 17, and really believing in something and how that can really help form your identity as a human being, where you, you follow artists that you really believe they mean it and you, 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 you invest your time with them and you develop with them and, and you, you develop world views through music and art and things like that. And then just to, to learn that it's all just been a money-making exercise is not, not cool, you know. No, but I mean, incredible integrity on your end there really uh, to uh, also to, to realize that what was going on. Um, you know, I, I spoke um, to Richard Barbieri a few weeks ago um, yeah. And, and he, he told me horror stories about that time, like things he had to go through with management and stuff. And uh, so, um, so I, l- let me just, you know, like ask this question. So how did, how did things turn out for you when you left the band? So what, what happened? I had to recover. I took a long time to recover because I, I ended up having agreed to leave. I then went back on the road to North America to finish the tour and I ended up, something was wrong, you know, like I was probably having too good a time, but also my central nervous system just collapsed. 
And my brother not being there, my brother didn't go back on the road. Something about that put me in a very strange headspace. So I started having panic attacks. And mm-hmm. then I started having panic attacks on stage. So of course, then you then you think every time you're going to walk out, you know, it's a, it just becomes a downward spiral. The last gig I did was a kind of quite a big club in Dallas in October '87, and I had a panic attack walking out, and I was hyperventilating all the way through the gig for two hours, and then you know, and, and I just I got on a plane the next day and went home to see my doctor to London. We had a day off. He took one look at me and stuck me in hospital for two weeks. He put me on drugs on a sleep cure. You know, mm-hmm. I was done. You know, I was completely yeah. done. And I think my body was trying to get me out of there. My body was saying, you shouldn't be, get the hell out. You know? mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Uh, because of that, it did a lot of damage. Of course, you know, then it's really hard to go back on the stage when you you have the memory of that. So it took me two years to get back on the stage. And that was with Nigel Kennedy at the Dominion Theatre. Mm-hmm. And uh, then I started to do things. And, and then I had kids uh, and uh, I was doing projects and I moved to the West Country and I had, I did actually have a few more mental health problems at the end of the 90s. It was quite a tricky time. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, a lot of, uh, kind of weird how life gets in the way. I mean, I, I was really, I could build up a head of steam around 2004, 2005. And then it transpired that my, I needed to look after my kids. I had my, I was a single parent for five years from 2005, 2010. Mm-hmm. And that took, pre- you know, that, that just stopped everything. And I came back to London. I think I put Watertight out in 2009. Without any promotion, I just put it out, you know, and came back to London mm-hmm. and started again and started writing and things like that. So it's just the arc of life. What What's interesting about the new work is that if people like it enough, if people are interested enough, I've got so many freaking tunes knocking around because I've been writing, you know, even in lockdown, you know, writing mm-hmm. like an idiot. So there's lots, lots of music to come if we can get enough traction and find an audience. Mm-hmm. And and also, you know, that means a lot of different things have to fall into place. But uh, all you can do is the best you can do, isn't it? So yeah, it's been an interesting journey, I have to say. Yeah. So if you if you want to talk about depression and anxiety, I'm a bit of an expert in those two fields. And uh, you know, to come have come through a lot of those things is one of the greatest achievements of my life, I think, because I, I had to mm-hmm. I had to work a lot of stuff out. You know, there was a period of time when I I couldn't function in any way, shape, or form, let alone uh, as a musician. It's a shame, really, to leave the band and have those problems, because I could have just got got on with it and played drums with lots of different people. I would have I, I would, I, I would have liked that, you know. Uh, one of the things about, you know, I know that you played with countless musicians. One, one of the things that was great about being in a band was developing a thing within a band. But also, one of the things that's negative about that is that you don't have the opportunity to explore mm-hmm. other things and we were very much like you had to be in Liverpool too. you can't do it no side projects you can't go and do a session you know mm-hmm. I, I would I would like to have had more experience with other musicians at that time I think but uh, at least now I, I, I over the last sort of 15 years so I, I have that experience you know I work in Italy I go to Germany and I, 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 I want to move to Vienna at some point I love that city so you know, I'm lucky now to to be doing different things mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you know, it's, uh, would you agree that, you know, if you get into a situation like you were in with the band and the success and like all the positives of that, um, there inevitably there's a price to pay somehow. And you really, yeah. you really only realize uh, what that price is when you stop. Right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so, you know that that's that's one of the reasons why I have to say I'm a little concerned, um, you know, about you know all those touring musicians uh, that I know and also those that I don't know that have to be home now, like and for over yeah. a year now. You know, it's 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 crazy. I really, it's I think it's really it's really intense, and I, really I really, really, yeah. I, I really I really hope that um, you know most people will come back. You know, will return from this. From this state well we all know what's going on with theaters my daughter works for dance ron bear which is a very very important uh you know dance company and she's technical manager for dance ron bear and mm-hmm. you know the, 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 she, she's lucky because she's had she had that job she got employed about a year before the pandemic so she has an actual job but of mm-hmm. course most people in that world as you know are obviously self-employed it's mm-hmm. absolutely devastating all the dancers all the Technicians, you know, it's absolutely, you know, the National Theatre 
in, in the South Bank had to shed 700 jobs, you know. So it's kind of, oh, God. You just hope that those spaces will exist. Uh, I don't, and I know that my friends in Vienna uh, last summer, there were 800 outdoor shows paid for by the government mm -hmm. to employ all the musicians. It was free to the public. But, you know, that kind of attitude doesn't exist here. You know, they're, they're, they're ignorant people. They're, they're Philistines about the government. And mm -hmm. they don't give a shit about the art. You know, they don't care about the arts. And they've slashed arts funding. They've slashed arts education in school. So they don't care, give a sh shit about dancers. I remember there was a, a, there was a talk of, there was a very high level conversation with Downing Street, uh, maybe about a year ago, or maybe in May of last year with Sam Mendes, um, all these kind of really high flying cultural figures in, in the UK with Downing Street. And apparently Dom, Dominic Cummings, who was like Boris Johnson's advisor at the time, uh, shouted at Sam Mendes at one point when they're talking about the arts, he said, the effing ballerinas can get to the back of the effing queue, you know, like mm. as if it's the least of our worries. Mm. And these people don't understand the dynamic of art in this culture. Just on a purely economic level, what art does, you have like the Sadler's Wells in London, you know, you have a ballerina on that stage, then you have the, the taxi drivers dropping people off at the venue, you have the food and drink being provided to the people working the venue, the whole microcosm, economic microcosm that exists around art at mm -hmm. a venue or a club or a space or a theatre or a cinema, it's just like they don't get it, you know, and like the, if you just look at it purely in economic terms, like I think the art, the creative sector in the UK brings over 100 billion a year to the economy, well, it did, you know. And yet they're, they're going on about fish the whole time, you know, fishing. Like, yeah, we'll get, get, we'll leave the EU so we can get our fishing rights back. Get, you know, it's unbelievable where we're at, you know. Mm. So yeah. uh, unfortunately, we're in a situation where the people in power don't understand the importance of, of the cultural sector in this country. It's mm. terrible, it's terrifying. You know, like the, the whole Brexit mentality, I, I absolutely, personally, I don't get it. But I mean, the the reason for it may be really bad education for decades, right? Like that people don't really see the value in 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 freedom, let's say, or in, in freedom to, to move and in being united with other people, right? And... Uh, I, I find it I find it shocking you know I was I was actually personally hurt you know as a German that uh you know that when brexit was suggested even you know I was I, I, I still can't believe it okay I mean there are very dark forces at work to, to make that happen the propaganda surrounding brexit like we, there would be these sun the uplands and we were in the EU we'd have 350 million pounds per week to spend on the NHS all these lies that were told and the prime minister of this country boris johnson was one of the people to tell these horrendous heinous lies and he's ended up as the prime minister we yeah. are absolutely screwed as a country right now i mean i i, I never agree with uh, i didn't agree with everything that was going on i didn't like the federalization of the eu i didn't like uh, the push for the euro or across the board i think if, i think accepting you know countries like greece and other countries i think the way the ecb treated greece after the crash was absolutely horrendous, you know, mm -hmm. and I think the idea of an EU army, all these lunatics pushing for that stuff, there's a lot of things to, to be worried about with the federalization of uh, all the democratic deficit of the heart of the EU, like the, the commissioners and all that kind of stuff. There's, but there are problems to be solved, you know, not to be, not, you know, we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. And one of the worst things for the cultural sector in this country was even during this ridiculous Brexit negotiations that the, the Tories engaged in with, with so little faith and lying about the EU the whole time, lying about the commission, you know, you know uh, the, the woman, uh, um, amazing woman uh, commissioner, I can't remember her name. But, uh, but the thing is, they were offered an artistic freedom of visa. They were actually offered it. No wasn't going to cost them politically anything. And they refused. No, it wasn't going to cost them. The EU said, what about this for the artistic community? And they said, no. And it could have been like, you know, can you imagine like filmmakers, photographers, dancers, actors, musicians, all being able to travel freely and that free flow of, of creativity. No, we're not having that. We don't want that. <laughs> so, yeah, unfortunately, the because there was one politician at the time, Jeremy Corbyn, who's so vilified in this country, in a way that I've never seen in my lifetime. Uh, like, it, it's quite extraordinary what the press did to him. But he was saying in 2016, look, we need to remain in the EU, but we need to push for a reform. 
And I think a lot of people across Europe were saying the same thing. There was lots of discontent in Austria and in Holland and in Italy. But like you could stay in the EU and push for reform in mm -hmm. the areas you didn't like. Mm -hmm. But that, that argument got just drowned out in all the xenophobia and all the racism and the bigotry and, and the stupidity. And, and you know, you, you travel around the world, you know, I travel around the world and, and it's very difficult. We just get used to this mindset. But of course you're talking about people who, who haven't, my education came through travel because talking to young German people, young Irish people, young Italian people, read this book, you know, the history of our troubles, you know, I, I, I got my education through travel, whereas somebody living in, in Middlesbrough or, or a northern town in England who only reads the sun or these tabloid and they don't travel in, you know, maybe they go on holiday to Torre Molinas once a year, or something, but they don't travel the way that you and I know that is, where mm -hmm. we can actually communicate and we learn. And they are just, they are a subject to that propaganda. Um, mm -hmm. And you couldn't argue with these people. Now, of course, with the horrendous results of the Brexit deal and whole businesses going to the wall because they can't trade with Europe, mm -hmm. like it, it's now sinking in just what's happened. And all these people that were going, we hate the EU. Now they're going, they're losing their businesses. They're losing their homes. And they're going, well, we, that's not what we voted for. It, it, it is what you voted for. So mm -hmm. it's, gonna, it's I think it's a shameful period in our history. And it may be, you, you're seeing something historically in this country. You may, we, the UK may lose Scotland in the next, if there's an independent referendum. You may lose Wales. There's, mm -hmm. there's, there's more, you know, troubles have come back to Northern Ireland. And it may be that the, the Irish people just go, oh, let's just reunify. Let's just get rid of this whole nonsense. Mm -hmm. You know, it may be that we might be just left with this stupid little country, England, mm -hmm. with all these people going, yeah, we don't need anybody. We're, you know, mm -hmm. we're, you know we're, we're the great British empire, all these absolute lunatics. And, and it's basically, we just got to get the hell out. You know, the, I've got to get to Vienna sometime mm -hmm. soon, Marcus. You know. <laughs> get me did, away did, from these did. lunatics. You know, I, I used to live in Austria for almost 10 years. Well, I, was, I, I was in Innsbruck, in Tyrol. Innsbruck, okay. Yeah. yeah. Was, was an, it was an interesting. Yeah, yeah it was, it's, it's like just uh, south of Munich, just yeah. like an, an hour south of Munich. It was, it was an interesting time, I have to say. It was, um, wasn't easy. And at some point I wanted to leave. Um, but, I, you know, I was married there and... Um, it's absolutely beautiful there, but as as a German, you it's you have a hard time there. It's really uh, yeah, yeah. I guess would, would would it will be easier uh, for somebody who doesn't speak German? <laughs> it's it, I find it fascinating how like uh, um, so what kind of signals let's say uh, people pick up on to put you in a. Uh, in a in a group right in a box you know that's the german or you know yeah. uh, you know and um it was kind of fascinating with austria because it was so much about the sound of your voice right so in a way it was it's kind of like it was really educational how much power um you know the pronunciation of a word has over the emotions um of the, yeah. of the person who wants to have a certain emotion let's say you know towards somebody it, it was it was interesting i mean i i i don't want to miss that that experience but um yeah i'm, ba I'm back in germany now in berlin so well yeah I mean, <laughs> if, if i was to live in, in any other country but you know i'm gonna be going to live in austria but i'm living i want to move to live in vienna it's like if i was to go to live in, the, in america i'd live in new york you know yeah it's, sure. it's not america you know yeah, like exactly. berlin berlin isn't necessarily it's not germany no yeah, yeah. And I, yeah. I could, I could live in Cologne, maybe, but I, I would always want to be in a, a cultural center. You know, yes. I, I, London has so many things that are wrong, you know, the cost and all that. But obviously not in the pandemic. But normally, culturally, it's incredible. You know, you, I, I'm always going to galleries, dance pieces, gigs. I, I have that life, and, and and I. So if I was to move anywhere, like Vienna, Vienna is a little bit different in terms of things that I normally go to. But it, but it's it's one of the most culturally rich cities in the world and it's got the, yeah. some of the uh, one of the most incredible i mean the, the i think the, the burke theater in vienna is the most uh, well-funded spoken word theater in the world with a budget mm -hmm. of 18 million euros or something you know mm -hmm. so there, there's something about 
the, the fact that that country values art really appeals to me. And also, I don't know about you, but I've never been into Croatia or Czech Republic or Romania, Bulgaria. I've never been to these countries. We never mm -hmm. toured in those countries. I, I, I wouldn't mind plonking myself in Central Europe and I can go up to Cologne yes. work with my friends. I can go to Rome and I can then go into... I have some friends in Sofia. I've never seen them. I've never gone to their place, you know. So I would love to be able to have that experience because I love Eastern European music and I've always been inspired by the harmonies of that of the parts of Europe, you know. Remember uh, La, La Mastia de Voix Bulgare, the sort of... Yeah, the, sure. The, Bulga the, the Bulgarian women's choir, radio choir. Yeah. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. that, the harmonies... Mm -hmm. There's something extraordinarily beautiful about music from Romania and Croatia and that, that part of the world. And um, I, I work with a friend, Matthias Jakasic, who was a, a Viennese composer. And he did on my on Watertight as a piano piece called Dark Actress. And mm -hmm. Matt's, Matt's arranged that. It's all, it's like, it sounds like a Hollywood orchestra, but it's just him with his violin and viola. But mm -hmm. you, can hear, you can hear it because of the way he slides some notes. It's got this. It's got this Eastern European. It's not a Croatian thing going on, you know. It's like that's that that comes mm. from the East. That's not like, that's not from the Northern Europe. That's mm. something else. It's kind of interesting how musically you can just pick up on those things, you know. You know, I, I used to play with a uh, violin player from Hungary, uh, Zoltan Lantos, and he has like this incredible mix of that eastern european flavor like the gypsy style and yeah, yeah. and yeah. and also he he spent quite a few years in india uh, studying indian classical oh, wow. music so he has a mix of those two things that's oh my God. pretty pretty amazing <laughs> yes hey so uh you said like your new album is is that out yet or is it's coming out soon i mean like i be, i did an interview on bbc just now and they played the next single not the current single which is the dance so mm -hmm. it's going to be i think there's two more tracks Apparently, the way it works with Spotify and uh, streaming services is that you can't release tracks as singles that are on product that's already been released. Mm -hmm. So we have to put a bunch of tracks out and then put the album out probably at the end of May. Yeah. So I hope to talk to the, the wonderful director, Sarah Shearer, who's based in Vienna, who did the video for Beautiful Words. I'm trying, we're trying to organize another video for the fourth track. Mm -hmm. um, what's beautiful about that is the Beautiful Wounds is being entered in short film festivals all around the world. And there's a finalist in New York and finalist in, in Toronto and in Venice. I love that. You know, I love the fact that we have a piece of work that's actually a short film. You know, it's kind of an, an, an art piece. You know, mm -hmm. I kind of would love to, I'm, I'm, maybe you'll be in this world, but I'm trying to, forget, I'm trying to get some funding. Uh, for a couple more films to do it as short films rather than a video. It's not like a video for me, it's like a short film. Because I love that, I love dance, you know, I love modern dance, I love contemporary dance. Um, so I'd love, to, I'd love to be involved more in that world, you know, of uh, theatre and dance. So it's kind of leaning towards that a little bit, you know. Yeah, I, I have to say, I was, I was pretty surprised by that video or that, you know, yeah. that film that went along with, with Beautiful Wounds. Um, incredible. So, what, what's what's the next? What's the second single? Or maybe maybe before we talk about that, just tell me a little bit about the album. Kind of like where, uh, when did you start writing it, or where, where did the the impetus come from to do it? Well, it was, it was put together over quite a period of time, actually. Probably, uh, I mean, the music probably could have been released at the beginning of two thousand nineteen. I mean, because mm -hmm. it was uh, ready, but of course, a lot of events happened in our in our lives through that period that, you know, meant that things stopped. Also the pandemic, we, we could have released the album last year. So mm -hmm. it's been a, around a while, but I think the album was kind of recorded between 2013, 2018, you know, mm -hmm. a bit, a bit, and along with other, I've got loads of other things I recorded that, you know, that are in certain various stages of construction, you know, but it just seemed to be a body of work at a certain point. I was working at the studio in the Isle of Wight called Chell Abbey Studios, and mm -hmm. we just said we've got we've, this is an album, you know. What what do you think? And they've got a label. So let's let's do something. And we put together that video. The video was recorded at the beginning of in January two thousand nineteen. And then like in, in obviously, uh, I don't know people might not know, sorry, but you 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 would know that my brother left us in in beginning of May of that year. And mm -hmm. of course, you know that just everything had to stop for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, well, but my brother's actually on the album. Actually, he played on the track. Mm -hmm. He came down to the studio in the summer of two thousand eighteen. Just to hang and play on this track and play this incredible guitar. Mm -hmm. So the, when 
we were putting together the album, it was actually the, the, the owner of the studio said, you really should use that track because it wasn't meant for this album. It was meant for a, another project called the, a, a theatre and film project. But mm-hmm. he said, this, this is your track. You wrote it and this is your vibe. You're all, you're all over it. And this is your brother playing guitar. And I spoke, I spoke to Boone's daughter and she she was really for it, you know. So I didn't want to be, I didn't want to sort of exploit it in any way. Yeah. But like it's great because you know he's on he's on my album, you know. So mm-hmm. I feel really good about it. So there's all sorts of kind of crazy twists and turns, and it's, you know, that's already a very dark period, but also some very positive things. And and a lot of things happen. Like uh, the single that's out at the moment, the dance was recorded in a certain way. I began recording that in 2013, 14, and it was a certain thing that was sitting there, and then. I went to see my friend on the Isle of Wight, this incredible musician called Rupert Brown. Very, you'd love him, but he's he's not. If you asked him to play B, you know, E flat nine, he would he wouldn't he wouldn't be able to do it, you know. But he could he could he just does everything by sound and figuring it out. But the parts he comes up with are extraordinary, and the sonics are incredible. So we worked on this ostinato piano part on his little deck piano, and all of a sudden it started to take on a life. And we worked on the drum track. He had a, an old a British uh, four into one mixer from the 50s called a Vortexian and it had also had this incredible compression a bit like a it's almost like a Fairchild and, um, so you listen to the snare, snare drum sound on on the dance is you know it's just I'm playing the drums really quietly with this like a bit of uh, parchment paper on the snare and like just tapping around like that and it sounds huge you know and then mm-hmm. the incredible bass player Mark Neary did this beautiful bass part Bern Locker who's a an incredible guitarist based in Vienna did the these guitars so all of a sudden it starts to so it took a while to get to the place where it, it needed. It sounded like it needed the sound, you know. And I think now I've kind of figured out how I want to make music, having gone through it. But if you'd have heard this, these tunes four years ago, they were in various states of disrepair. Mm-hmm. It was a very different proposition. Mm-hmm. And I've had to go through that process to figure out how I want to make records. There's a track on the album called, the, it's called The Thank You Song. I couldn't think of a title. It's basically a song of, gratitude to all the people that helped me along the way, the teachers and friends. And, but uh, it was, it was, it's really stripped out and it's very simple. And when I kind of conceived, when we, when, when we recorded it and we conceived of it, I really felt a real, um, uh, how, how do I say this? I really felt like a very powerful uh, connection to the, the space in that song. And I, I'd been used to having a lot of layers, you know, so I think going forward from this, the music I'm going to make will be much more like that, like more like as if you're in a band, where it's just elements rather than just loads of string pads. And I mean, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I love layered music, but I think going forward, I, I think, I think during the course of the album, I kind of learn how I want to make music going forward. But it actually hangs together as a body of work, and I'm really proud of the sound. Who knows what people make of the songwriting? But I think sonically, it's as good as anything around. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we worked, me and Julian on the mixes, we worked our backsides off for months. I mean, we weren't absolutely crazy on it, but in, in that way that, you know, we, I love, you know, I love going crazy on mixes. <laughs> ah, you know, no, I said, I said 2 dB of the BV, not 1 dB, Julian, you know, is, no, that is, kind of thing. is Julian still, still working a lot? Yeah, he's doing a lot of mixing and stuff in Australia and he, and he's, mm. he's, he's great, you know, he's, and he's, what I love about Julian it's like like most of the musicians I work with, he's relentless. He won't give up. Mm-hmm. He, you know that's not right. That's not right. He even when we actually recut the the uh, uh, the dance as a single, we actually went back to the mix and he started fiddling about. And there was uh, as a bass player in Germany called Peter Enigauer, who lives in Berlin. I don't know if you know Peter, but he's a yeah. serious classical guy, but a really great jazz bass player. And he's on one track, but Peter had done these kind of, you know, almost cello like things in the upper register on a double bass. And it was in the track, but we hadn't heard it. When Julian went back to read the, the single, he said, there's, there's this thing here, you know, I, I pushed it and you hear it. And like, and it's like, I, I just love that about mixing, how somebody can bring that stuff out. So then we had to recut the album because, you know, we need to do that, but, that, but that's going to that's gonna be on the album, you know? So I, I love working with people that care so much like that, like, I'm sure you do, and and and, and people yeah. like Wally, and, and I'm sure I know I do. I, I I won't I won't ever I, I don't work with anybody that says that that that'll do, you know. And nobody I work with ever does that. Mm-hmm. Oh, that that's mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. So it's yeah. it's great. Yeah, yeah. 
you know, it's uh, it's always it's only finished if the shrink wrap is on the CD, right? That's kind yeah, of exactly, the... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, yeah. I, if I had a chance now, there's a song I would re-record the vocal. I didn't because when when I was recording the vocal that year, uh, I had I didn't know, but I had an ulcer, mm -hmm. and, I, and mm -hmm. I and I didn't know how bad it was, so I was coughing all the time, da da da, 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 da like that in a coughing off the mic. And it's, it just sounds a bit weird to me. I know I can do it better, but I think that's cool. There's a track. Okay, I, I think that vocal I could do, you know, I'll do that again. But I think I think you always need that one of those on an album, you know. Mm -hmm. you go, oh, damn, I forgot. I think on, uh, on, on World Machine, I remember when we were on the road doing the tour for that, Mark, well, on the bus one time, we were listening to um, a Physical Presence, and Mark said, oh, shit, we left the harmony off the chorus. We forgot mm -hmm. the harmony, on, and there's a he played the demo. Yeah, there's a harmony on the chorus, like a physical presence perfected in sight. There's a harmony, and we've forgotten it. You know, <laughs> so what? What happens? Let's go back and do it again. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's those it's those things that the, the people then love. You know, like the little mistakes yeah. and the little you yeah, know, yeah yeah yeah. I still yeah, to it, but Jeremy, we love like we were talking about. Like, there's so many records that have these massive mistakes on them. Mm -hmm. that I wouldn't have left give, given my own nature but you, you're totally fine with it we're talking about like Black Dog you know uh, Led Zeppelin um, <laughs> you know uh, but Jimmy Page could never play that well mm -hmm. <laughs> so when he's playing the you know he's actually uh, he's like rushing and mm -hmm. John Paul Jones is trying to hold him back and but it's like it's one of the biggest rock albums of all time. Mm. Nowadays, the, the producer would probably go, hang about, let's put that in, we'll put, we'll, we can time stretch that or something, you know. Mm. But no, it's like, uh, you know, and we all hear it, don't we? But mm. it's fine. It's Black Dog. It's Led Zeppelin. Get over mm. it, you know. Mm. <laughs> uh, you know, and, I mean, there's a, there's a John McLaughlin album, isn't it, called Electric Guitarist, where he does all these pieces with uh, various combination musicians he worked with, Carl Santana and the Jack Bruce and Tony Williams and things like that. And there's one track where Narada Michael Walden's on drums with Salma Santana, where the drums and the rhythm, the percussion go completely out of time with the mm -hmm. rhythm track. And mm -hmm. me and Mark, when we first heard that, probably the end of the 70s, go, what, did you hear this? <laughs> but they're out and then they come back in again, you know. Mm -hmm. And you hear it every time, but you've kind of... That's okay. It's fine. You know, it's amazing how. Why am I so perfectionist? Then why? Why well, gonna have some mistakes in there? I've got to have some speeding up or something, or we've got to drop a stick. You know, because it's it's cool. You know, I I enjoy music like that, but I can't seem to make it myself. It's got to be right. You know, <laughs> got to be true to your own nature, right? Hey, so um, at the very beginning of the conversation, you mentioned Jeremy Stacy, right? Yeah. Has he been a friend of yours? Yeah, I've known Jeremy a long time. He's been a very close friend for maybe the last 10, 12 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I knew, knew of him before, but we since I've been back in London, I came mm -hmm. back to London in 2010, so we, we're very close. Mm -hmm. He's amazing. I love Jeremy. He's my, I think he's one of the finest drummers around. He's also pro probably in a certain way, if you look at it a certain way, he's, he's kind of the, what, the UK's finest drummer because... Although he, you know, other drummers can do certain things, maybe on a technical level, but but he's when he plays rock, he sounds he he sounds authentic. When he mm -hmm. plays fusion, he sounds authentic. Mm -hmm. When he plays jazz or pop, he sounds authentic. Mm -hmm. Jeremy is the most forensic kind of musician I know. That if you if you ask him to do a session, he'll go in there with like twelve snare drums, three kits, three bags of cymbals. And he'll be changing things around, and he might change the whole kit for the next track. You know, he's not, mm -hmm. he's, he's just, and he's thought about it. It's, it's incredible, like that, Jeremy. He's got this amazing thing. You know, there are drummers like people like Carl and Ash, these incredible groove pocket drummers, but they're, they're kind of known for that they play their way. Whereas with Jeremy, he, he can play like uh, Ringo, or he can, he can play, he can play like kind of. Uh, Alvin Jones, you know, or, or he can, you know, play like a fusion head, you know, mm. it's, it's pretty wild, you know. Yeah. To me, it's still amazing and just wonderful that he ended up in King Crimson and uh, yeah. playing, playing keyboards and, uh, you know, he had solo spots on, on keyboards in King Crimson incredible. as well. It's like incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would also, I would really love to talk to him as well for this at some point. Yeah. Yeah, those 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 guys actually, both of them. I mean, Paul is Paul is another one. 
mm. Paul Stacey, like they're yeah. they're extraordinary people, the Stacey brothers, because they both started life dancers. I think Jeremy was a ballet dancer originally when he was a kid. They they both became actors, and they mm. came to music later. But you listen to they've just got these incredible brains. You know, I mean, I Jeremy never played piano around me much, and all of a sudden he's doing that King Crimson stuff. But like, you know, doing Keith Tippett's cable parts, you know, how the hell is that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you listen to you listen to Paul Stacey's guitar playing. One of the most extraordinary, you know, it's incredible what he can do, and it's mm. just completely self-taught, natural talent, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it's almost like that. What's quite cool about people is they come from it from a different angle. They were actors, and then they became musicians. So they they have a different mind the way the the matrix is wired in a different way yeah yeah cool. yeah exactly yeah if i have to say for me um making music was always a little bit of a of a puzzle you know like something that i had to you know it was it didn't it never really came natural at least that's what i was what that's what i was thinking for a long time so but now you know i have some thoughts that maybe there's like a specific talent for composition that maybe is something that I've been gifted with rather than something that I had to work on, yeah. you know, but, or, or I think in, you know, in the end, it's just like your, your, uh, your passion and interest in, in a subject, right. That then over the years, you can't help, but become good at it. Right. And yeah. 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 So I think it's like, I think it's like, sorry, it's like when you're, we, we were very isolated in the other way. So it's just like, we had, a, we desired, we wanted to, had a need to do it. And, I think it's quite cool that we weren't exposed to so many young other musicians, like of, of a high, you know, that were doing things in a certain way because we were just finding our own way, mm -hmm. you know. And a lot of that was, you know, rehearsing through the winters without being exposed to any other musicians around because, you know, the, the, the Isle of Wight was full of seaside towns that had hundreds of musicians every summer because of all the little bars had trios there before recorded, you know, DJs, you know, it was like the trio quartet. All the hotels have musicians, you know, so hundreds mm. of musicians. In the winter, it was just completely dead. So we we're finding our own way with it. It wasn't like we were, um, you know, uh, and we, we were desperate to do it. We had this absolute need to do it. And you have to have that. And you have to have the, the courage and the balls, basically, to go, no, I'm not going to do that. I, I, I want to, you know, when somebody says you need to have this, you, you, you know, well, why? You know, you don't just go, yeah, I'll do that then. You know, I was mm -hmm. always getting stick when I first came to London about doing rim shots because I love the sound of a rim shot. All, all the producers want you to play in the middle of the drum. So, no, I'm not doing that, you know. I'm gonna, I, you know, I think you need to be a bit like that to get to, to develop a career in music. You need to be a little bit hard, you know, hard skinned and yeah. be quite, well, screw you, I'm going to do it my way, you know. Yeah. I mean? yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, and you know, like, in a, in a way, um, um, being on the Isle of Wight, Wight and uh, being in the north of Finland, for example, where you know you have uh, many months of of dark, and you can you oh, can yeah. really sh you can really woodshed and and I you know sometimes I you know I I, I envy people who have a <laughs> have a youth like that you know where you can really like for me it started very late like I was twenty when I when I actually understood that there's such a thing as you know uh practicing an instrument or something you know it was uh, yeah. ridiculous but my love for music was always there and um and i'm i i couldn't be um uh, happier actually having having had my career up until this point you know and now things yeah. seem seem like totally open again like you know i had i had a life before i was a touring musician um because like the the stickman gig would, which was the first real international uh gig i had started yeah. when i was 37 or 38 so really late really late so so for me this this pandemic basically just meant going back to an older life that i knew right so it was easier yeah. for me than it is for others and uh, and now you know i don't know let's just let's just see like tours get pushed um to next year to next year and i i really hope that uh I mean, Tony Levin just posted something today that they have like four shows in the in the summer with you know he has a he has a band with his brother like a jazz trio or quartet and okay all and, right and so it seems that some you know at least a, a few shows are you know happening again in the summer so let's see you know I I got I got a visa a new visa for the U.S. 
in uh, July uh, 2019, and uh, so I couldn't couldn't really use it. It's only good for three years. So in a year, it's, uh, oh, shit. it's over. And, yeah. I, and those are a real pain in the ass to get. So uh, so I don't know. I don't know. It was it was a real pleasure talking to you, Phil. Yeah, you too, Marcus. Nice to have a chat, man. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes, really wonderful. Yeah, I think like the first time you wrote to me was like almost fifteen, maybe fifteen years ago on MySpace. We 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 were oh, yeah. in contact back then. Yeah, I think I, when I came back to London, you, you you there was talk of a tour, wasn't there? Something, there was something. Yeah, happy. exactly, exactly, exactly. And I contacted you about that. Yeah, yeah. I, I was kind of like uh, finding my feet back in London. Yeah, but it's nice. You know, when I get to Vienna. I mean, I, I do want to get to Vienna in terms of living there. It may, may be part-time initially, about half the month, you know, two weeks on, two weeks off. But yeah, it'd be, be nearer you. So Wonderful. Um, hey, so so how old are your kids now? Well, my, my eldest son is 40, 41. Mm-hmm. And then uh, my Jack is 32 and Holly's 28 now. So yeah, they're getting up there. So the, Alex is, I'm working with Alex. On, I'm actually doing a session tomorrow. Alex is the engineer, so... Alex is really talented. He's got a beautiful voice, actually. He's a couple mm-hmm. of songs, and he's got a really interesting music. He's, he's an amazing musician, Alex. Like you, he's, he's coming to it late. He's plugging in. He's plugging into the right socket, but he's got so much to offer. In fact, mm-hmm. going forward, the, the live gigs, he'll be kind of my, like my MD, working with me on the, you know, organizing it and playing mm-hmm. keyboards so I can play. He can play drums, so I can, if I'm playing keyboards, he can play drums sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, and my son, Alec, my son Jack, lives in China. He's a, is a uh, works with language companies and teachers out there. And my daughter works for Dance One Bear. She's a technical manager for mm-hmm. dance companies. Mm-hmm. She worked, she worked with Hofesh Schechter for many years. It's a great dance company. Mm-hmm. And now she's with Dance One Bear. So yeah, she's she inhabits that world of. So like a couple of years ago, she was in Paris in Montmartre, doing a, a piece, and we all went to Montmartre for Christmas to see her dance. It's kind of mm-hmm. like that's great, you know. I don't know about you. Do you have kids? Yeah, a very, very young daughter. She's still a baby. Oh. So, <laughs> but you know, it seems seems like you've passed on your your love for the arts and for for languages, right? Or you know, for words, words somehow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And now, and now you get it back because my daughter's turning me on to music, and my son's turned me on to music. You know, my daughter mm. turned me on to Bon Iver. You know, um, not time ago now, but mm-hmm. that's great. I love it. Get you get 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 paying it back. You know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so they, they, yeah, they, they, they had a good musical education. But one thing that well, it's funny because uh, I was just being sent this by uh, my, my wonderful friend Paul Waller did all the artwork for this box set, and uh, oh, it's amazing because they got they found the original masters. But mm-hmm. the thing is, the kids have never asked me much stuff about level forty two. I mean, of course they, you know, but they never say, "Hey, Dad, you know when you wrote that lyric, what do you?" You know, they never showed a real interest. But I'm going to buy them one each of these. And I'm going to ask them questions in about a, a year's time. So, okay, well, what do you think about I Want Eyes? What do you think about the lyrics? You know, so, <laughs> some interest, God damn it. Yeah, <laughs> Phil, you, Phil, you did some wonderful work there. And um, yeah, really, really, I can't, well, you, I think you, you must have heard it many times, but it's really, uh, uh, Level 42 is an incredible, that period was incredible. And I, yeah, I think time. that a lot, a lot of, a lot of musicians nowadays they they grew up on on this music and and I don't I don't know I mean that you know like when you were mentioning before like during the time I don't think there was any other band that somehow like compared with Level Forty Two at all there was nothing or am I wrong I mean were there bands that weren't successful that were kind of like in the same league. We, I think what was interesting about us, we were coming from, you know, having grown up with Progressive Rock and McLaughlin, the Weather Report, yeah. my visual was, we, we were coming from a place of, of very kind of out there music. And the fact, the first gig that Mark and my brother and I did uh, a Greenpeace Benefit when I was 19 was on the Isle of Wight. Mm-hmm. And it was, Mark had this song called Killer Whale. Actually, it, was, it saved the whale, this concert. But he did a song called Killer Whale. It sounded mm-hmm. like kill a whale but it's like you know kill a whale and it was all these kind of weird you know the you know the hendrix chord with a seventh with a flat with a raised ninth or something you know so it's got that kind of yeah. you know the kind of uh, uh, uh. Um, and so we were coming from this place of very um angular music and we, we it was in us 
But then we were trying to write, because of Love Meeting Love, trying to write contemporary kind of funky songs or whatever, and trying to please a record company. But when, so, you know, we, we could do that, but then we had all this musical stuff that could be added to that. So sometimes it was really simple, but sometimes, like, you know, June Tune on the first album, which is a, a melody of Marx, had that kind of Stanley Clark inspired kind of thing on the bass. But that's a really beautiful tune, and it's not a three chord trick, it's just a wonderful journey musically. And that just comes from him. So there was that in the air, as well as Love Games, you know, the four chord trick of Love Games. So it's kind of it's interesting. So I think it gave a lot of musicians hope because a band could be musical within the context of writing contemporary pop music or funk pop music or whatever. There was also the musical element. I think I think I remember Jeremy saying that it was like cool for his generation to come through that band because we were doing some instrumentals as well as doing top 20 records, you know. I think it was mm -hmm. a nice, I think it was flying the flag for a little bit of musicality in, in a certain period of time. And we were an accidental band. We got in there by mistake. Once mm -hmm. we got in there, they couldn't get rid of us. So I think it was, I think we, we, you know, we had some nice, you know, I know you said about the tribe, we had some nice chords, you know. So I think that's what I love about that, that it did inspire people to maybe pick up an instrument or inspire people to have a bit of courage in their own creativity, to not, just go along with what they're told you can do because mm. it's all about as you know it's all about finding your own voice you know yes yeah not many you know you're not interested in hearing another stevie wonder or another david bowie you're going to follow david bowie you're going to look for artists that have a similar courage to do something to do their own thing um mm. and like i think that's that's the thing i'm most proud of that we can have an album that could have eyes would have falling on it and the chinese way i mean how does that work you know, <laughs> or you know, or like he he throw he throw and turn it on. How do you do that? Like you know, how do you, how does that work? Dune tune and love games. You know, how, how does it? It's because it's what we did, and so it's then what you say it is. You know, so yeah, it was kind of a wing and a prayer, but uh, it was a beautiful journey. Yeah, it was great. Mm -hmm. It's good to look back on it now with with some gratitude. And re really, why I wrote that song, thank you, is to understand how how privileged we were to go through that experience. And, and now look back on it, all the bitterness, all the rancor, that's all gone. All that nonsense, the politics is all over. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. What, what what remains is some really nice tunes and great recordings and uh, 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 some energy that was good, positive. You know. Yeah, it's it's good to see that you're proud about that box set. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I haven't, I haven't listened to it yet because I'm got a CD player. I've just got myself a I've just got myself a new car, which has a, it's, but it's a little bit older. It has like four years old car. It has a CD player in it, so I could put this in the car. And really, <laughs> really get my kids fired up. From we'll go. I'll, I'll, so I'm going to go on a journey. We'll start with early tapes. We'll work our way through. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to put. Put them through the mill. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Phil. Yeah. Okay, Marcus, look after yourself. I will. You too. And yeah. see you. See you someday in the flesh. Yeah. See you soon. Have to have to meet up soon. Yeah. For a coffee. Yes. yes. All right. <laughs> bye bye. Take care. Take, Take care. Bye bye. See you, man. You too, man.